Okay, a good example. Uh, many errors here, more than one. You have to, to, to check how many occurred during the symbol event. Have you seen it? Identification, drag, double check, little lace. Oh, quite a few, huh? But a common situation, isn't it? Well, but now we're going to we move this, uh, this panel. Uh, and this morning you will have uh, some uh, talks about... Uh, oh, Portuguese. Where's <laughs> my Desculpe. Esta manhã é, tivemos uma série de, de conversas sobre é, o programa da Organização Mundial de Saúde. É, a Cláudia nos fez uma apresentação das iniciativas brasileiras, a Health Foundation, é, abordando, digamos, os temas é, mais gerais da qualidade do, do, do paciente. Tracy nos trouxe a importância da ISCOA como disseminadora de conhecimento e da, das preocupações específicas em relação à segurança do paciente. E, nesse momento, agora, o foco será é, em países... É, 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 o, como os países é, é, enfrentaram essa situação. Nós temos, a Escócia não é um país grande, é, mas está muito avançado na concepção de como organizar um programa é, de segurança. Avançou bastante, e, e, é, então é um grande prazer para nos trazer é, de um pequeno país uma grande abordagem do tema da segurança, Jason Lees, que em breve estará, nos, espero que todos vocês estejamos juntos lá é, para tomar um Scott em Edimburgo, agora em outubro, o que sediará a Conferência Internacional da ISCO em outubro. Edimburgo Jason será nosso anfitrião. É, também agora, de, de, Jason, tá, também compartilharão das mesas, da nossa mesa, o importante é, é, parceiro, que tem um país muito parecido com o nosso, um país grande, com um nível econômico de desenvolvimento equivalente ao nosso, e que instalou há alguns anos é, uma, uma Secretaria Nacional de Qualidade, e é, junto era secretário Henrique Ruelas, que foi presidente da ISCO ano passado, da nossa Sociedade Internacional para a Qualidade de Cidade, e, segundo o Henrique, entende mais do assunto do que ele próprio. Odete Sarabia, do México, vai estar aqui conosco, compartilhando a experiência. O México também é um país federal, com autonomia dos estados, sistema misto de saúde, então temos muito o que aprender. Ainda não unificaram, né? só para registro, Lá ainda continua existindo o Instituto Mexicano de Seguridade Social, que é o nosso INAMPES. Lá tem o INAMPES do Ministério de um lado, o Ministério da Saúde do outro, não é? Mas, enfim, vamos desafiar. E, finalmente, é, nos Estados Unidos da América do Norte, é, o colega... O que é o seu nome? O nome não está no script. Joe McCann. Joe McCann. Ele é do... Centro for Medicare and Medicaid Services é a maior agência, é o INAPS dos Estados Unidos para os brasileiros. É essa agência responsável por toda a administração do Medicaid, e Medicaid é o programa para 65 anos, pessoas com mais de 65 anos e portadores de deficiência. Começou com portadores de doença renal crônica e depois se estendeu para portadores de deficiência. É, o orçamento do, do Medicaid é maior do que muitos orçamentos mundiais, muitos PIBs do mundo, e também administra, isso é diretamente administrado por maneiras é, diferenciadas, é talvez o maior, um dos maiores sistemas públicos de saúde, e também a parte federal do Medicaid, que é gerenciada pelo CMS, Centro para Medicare and Medicaid Services, nos Estados Unidos. Então, é, também um país federal, multiplicidade de agências, multiplicidade de prestadores. Então, o desafio de construir, a partir do setor público, que são os dois programas ligados ao CMS, que pertencem ao Ministério da Saúde, mais forte que o... Eventualmente, o presidente do CMS é mais forte que o Ministro da Saúde, mas isso era é um pouco a relação que vivemos aqui no Brasil na época do Inamos. Bem, então, hoje, agora, essa mesa da tarde é para enfocar como fizeram para de tal forma que amanhã 
na oficina da manhã a gente possa compartilhar as nossas experiências, os desafios que esses países é, enfrentaram. Então, convidarei a Jason. Uh, Cristóvão. Meia aí. Half an hour, uh, every speaker. Alô, microfone móvel. Okay, so now you have to move from English to Scottish. <laughs> and there, there are two fundamental rules of Scottish. You talk quickly and you talk loudly. And the louder you speak, the more chance the overseas visitor has of understanding you. <laughs> so if you don't understand, I'm just going to shout louder. Okay? Seriously, if it is too fast or it's not funny enough or something else happens, please, please stop me. Camila will stop if I go too quickly. She'll have a Brazilian moment if you need a Brazilian moment to catch up. First of all, let me say how, how privileged I was to be asked. It's a wonderful opportunity to come to your beautiful country. I've never been to Brazil before. I spent the day yesterday in Rio. I went to a hospital in the morning, which was a fantastic opportunity to see the challenges of your healthcare system, the wonderful achievements of your healthcare system. And then in the afternoon, We kind of took the afternoon off, if I'm honest, and, and went up Sugarloaf Mountain. But please don't tell my employer, because I will get in trouble. I, I was asked both today and tomorrow for a smaller group tomorrow to try and describe to you the Scottish journey, the story of what Scotland has done around quality and safety. And, and I have two golden apologies. They tell you not to apologize before you present, and I'm going to give two. The first is that I don't understand your context. I'm not Brazilian. I don't speak Portuguese. So I don't understand your world. So you may wish to switch off and say you have nothing to learn from Scotland. That would be legitimate. But I, I think we have done something in Scotland that you can learn from. I don't think, and that's my other apology, is I don't think we're special. I don't think we have fixed it. I don't think we have all the answers, but I think we have some of the answers. And perhaps, as a minimum, we've done some of the things that you perhaps shouldn't do. So we have lessons, perhaps, that you already would. Thank you very much. This allows me to walk about a little bit. So, so, so some of the things that we have done that perhaps you, you wouldn't have to make the same mistakes again. The first difficulty, of course, is the size. Scotland is smaller than Rio. So we only have five million people. Now, in Scotland, it feels like quite a lot of people. But when you come to Brazil, you realize that's hardly any people. I want to introduce you to two Scottish people. This is Lucy and Lewis. They're a real family. I've met them a number of times. Lucy is a single mother. She's 28. This is her second baby. Lewis is 18 months old. He has never slept a night at home. He's been in social care with foster parents since his birth because his mother is a heroin addict. She has a six-year-old son who has been adopted and gone. She will never see that six-year-old son again. She reports, when you speak to her, 18 different agencies trying to access and help her. 18 different leaders, 18 different systems, a social worker, a doctor, a nurse, an addiction specialist, hosts of people trying to do their best to make care and help for Lucy work. And it didn't. It didn't work. And she lost her first child to adoption, and Lewis has never been at home. Now, in the town where Lucy and Lewis live, we have co-located the services in one place. We have broken down all the barriers by forcing the workers, the social workers, the doctors, the nurses, the addiction specialists, the dentists, all to work in the one place. 
And six weeks after this photograph was taken, Lewis slept at home for the first time in his life. And two months after this photograph was taken, the decision was made to allow Lucy unrestricted access to Lewis during the day. And then another six weeks later, unrestricted access to Lewis at home. So something is different in Scotland. Something is new. And quality improvement and the way we've done that is part of this story I'm going to tell you. But it starts with the challenges that Scotland face. And they are like your challenges. They may be on a different scale, but they're not unlike them. Now, this is what Scotland looks like from space. It is tartan. If you look down on Scotland, you can see all the different tartans. You, you believe me? No? Each of these different tartans is a health board. A board is our delivery system. So it's responsible for primary care, secondary care, public health, all the health care in that region. And it varies from Glasgow, where I'm from, the finest city in the world, right here. One and a half million people, 53,000 healthcare employees, a massive budget, and a big urban city with nine main hospitals. Up to Shetland, this is the Shetland Islands, 28,000 people, one hospital with less than 100 beds, closer to Norway than it is to Scotland, in fact. And we'd like to give it to the Norwegians, but the Norwegians won't take it. Because the people are all slightly odd. Because they choose to live in this isolated island. So each of these, each of these different colors is a different health board region. And they are responsible for all care. We have almost no private sector. We have a tiny, tiny private sector. But it's all publicly funded, all delivered by the NHS in Scotland. And you heard a little of the NHS's birth from Jonathan earlier. But we have some challenges. The first challenge is there is no money. This is the gap in Scotland's public finances. We are £39 billion short even to keep spending the same as it was before the global crash in the markets. So we have a £39 billion gap in our public finances. It's going to take to 2025 before we have the same investment in public services as we had in 2009. So what does that mean for health? In, in cash terms, in actual money terms, the, the funding is rising. But when you take into account the cost of salaries, the cost of kit, the cost of drugs, in real terms, the funding is falling. For the first time in 20 years, the funding of UK healthcare is falling. Now, Scotland has a devolved government. We make our own choices in Scotland about how we spend the money. The UK government gives us a briefcase of money. They don't literally give us a briefcase of money, but they give us a briefcase of money that we then divide how we want to spend it. So we decide how much to spend on health, but if we spend it on health, we can't spend it on education. If we spend it on education, we can't spend it on prisons. So we, ha we make those choices internally. So th first of all, there's no money. Second of all, the population is aging. So this is 1911. Lots of young people, hardly any old people. And then if you watch this graph develop in increments, this is the 70s, the 90s, 2011, so that's the most recent real data. And, and the projection is that that's going to get worse and worse and worse. It looks, I think, a bit like a cruise ship coming to get you. Don't you think? It looks like a big cruise liner coming to knock everybody over. And the tax base is disappearing. And this is me. I'm 44 years old. I am in this bulge because my parents chose to have children in the 1960s. Now, there were reasons why there was lots of children born in the 1960s, but maybe we shouldn't discuss that in polite company. But the 44-year-olds and the 50-year-olds are in that bulge, and there, aren't going to be, there isn't going to be provision. There isn't going to be money, and there isn't going to be services. This is another way of representing the same thing. So this is the increase in the elderly in Scotland by 2031 and the decrease in the young people until 2031. So there's no money, too many old people. So what do we do? So the Scottish government has a very clear vision. It doesn't always deliver the vision, but it at least knows what the vision is. 
And people come from all, all over the world principally to see Scotland's clarity of purpose. Scotland has decided its government and its people what it wants to do. And this is the government's purpose. Underneath that purpose are a series of objectives. Greener, smarter, healthier. You get the idea. And most of my job as the clinical director of the healthcare system is spent in the blue box, in the healthier box. But we also care about employment and climate change and all the other parts of the Scottish government's mission. So we took that healthier box, that's the vision, and we wrote in 2010 the healthcare quality strategy. We decided that the organizing principle of the Scottish healthcare system would be quality. This document is less than 30 pages long and it's got big writing. It is not a massive glossy policy brochure. It is built around what we're actually going to do, task, real change. And its ambition is that Scotland would be recognized as a world leader in healthcare quality. I wanted it to say the world leader in healthcare quality, but the civil servants inside the government were scared. The politicians were brave. They were brave enough to be the world leader, but the civil servants unfortunately changed. And we had quite a lot of debate for quite a long time about taking the word the out and changing it to ah. We have three ambitions inside that quality strategy to be safe, to be person-centered, and to be effective. These are words you'll recognize uh, in your work, in other people's work that you'll have seen around the world based on the Institute of Medicine's dimensions. But I'm gonna get more practical and granular in just a second about what we actually did. We had a partnership with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Joe and I first met when Joe was at the Institute and I was a fellow at the Institute. So we had an ongoing relationship with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And one of the things that the Institute has taught Scotland is the triple aim. And the triple aim around fixing the care experience, so making care safe and person-centered, but also doing that for the population. And we have responsibility for the population health as well as the individual health, and to do it for best value. So we've tried to build our programs around that triple aim and keeping that triple aim in mind. The challenge is we had all the traditional pieces in place. We have universities, we have researchers, we have guidelines, we have standards, we have inspection, we have scrutiny, and yet still care doesn't improve. For decade after decade after decade, nothing really changes. And when you look at the evidence, it turns out that all of these things, the research, the universities, the hard working, the people trying their best, are all necessary, but not sufficient. It isn't enough. Because it takes nearly 20 years to get 14% of the evidence into practice. I was a clinical academic for years. All I did was research. I did research after research after research. None of the research I did is in routine practice across the world. I'm still the only person who believes what I researched, even though it's true. I proved it to be true in my research and nobody has done anything with it. What's wrong with these people? Why won't they do what I told them in my research paper? It's not bad people, it's just very difficult to translate research into reality. You need three things, two of which I think in most healthcare systems are abundant. Not always, but two of which usually exist in abundance. You need will. You need leadership and workers to want to do something. That, the people I met in your hospital yesterday in Rio, if that is any indication of the rest of your healthcare system, then you're in good hands. They are enthusiastic, they want to improve, they care about their patients, they don't lack will. I also met a series of people full of ideas, wanting to change, wanting to do things, bursting with ideas to try and help. The third of them, though, is execution or implementation. How do you actually do it? How do you actually drive the change? And that, I would suggest, is the gap in Scotland and probably the gap in most countries in the world. Joe will expand that a little bit in a little while with some of his thinking around it. But let me give you an example of our implementation strategy. And the example you asked for was the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. So we decided in 2007 and 2008 to take a systematic approach 
to patient safety. We had guidelines, we had all the things, we had compulsory education online for every junior doctor, we had all of the conventional elements that you would expect to be in place, and yet we still harmed one in 10 of our patients. Our mortality was still too high. People were still having the wrong piece of the body operated on. People were still having swabs left in after surgery. So we decided to do a collaborative, an IHI-style collaborative at scale across the whole nation. This is the driver diagram, the so-called driver diagram for that program. It just indicates what it is we were trying to do. So I had an aim at one side, and then the buckets of things we were going to do. And Camila has been very kind to translate it into Portuguese. I was going to say I did it myself, but I didn't think you would believe me. So this is the Portuguese Scottish Patient Safety Programme driver diagram. You can have these slides away with you and you can read them at your leisure. The important thing is, and I'm going to have to switch back to the English because I won't understand it, is <laughs> only one of the elements is actually to deliver the collaborative. Only one of the five important things is to deliver the actual collaborative. The other ones are about the foundational pieces that have to be in place. So the Scottish government has to say it's the most important thing. The, the boards, the delivery system has to accept safety as a strategic priority. You get the idea. So the delivering the collaborative is only one fifth of all the things we did. We had to build a sustainable infrastructure. We had to make it align with the other programs. This won't be correct for you. It won't be the same as you, but bits of it might. Deming was one of the fathers of quality improvement, and Deming wouldn't see you unless you could describe to him what your method was. And publication and glossy brochures and guidelines are not a method. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient. So our method was based on the fact that this method had failed. This is what we have traditionally done. We've gone into a room of clever people, and we've designed. We've designed a drug form. We've designed a form for surgical safety. We've done something in a room with doctors and nurses and managers, and we've sat around usually for 18 months, sometimes longer, and then we've sent it out into the real world, and we've told them to do it. And then we get surprised when it doesn't work. We think they're stupid. So clearly they haven't been listening. I told them to do it. What's wrong with these people? And, and politicians do it all the time. My politician, my, my minister does it all the time. He tells me, I saw this in this city, go tell the other cities to do it. So we send them a letter and say, do it. And they say, no. In reality, the, the literature around change and improvement would tell you to do this. It would tell you to spend a really, really short time on design. Don't buy a laminator. Don't make it fixed. Go into the real world and test and modify it in the real world with real people. It, it somehow makes perfect sense, and yet we don't, we don't do it. So why don't we ask the patients, ask the nurses, ask the people who are in that front line all the time to do it? And then you test, and you test, and you test, and you change, and you change, and you change. And you might need to seek approval, because you might need it in a language, or you might, it might need to have the logo, or fine. But then you imp implement it, and you continue that cycle of change. So this is our theory. These are, this is our Scotland's change theory. You need a high level aim, timed and numeric. You need a goal, something that everybody can understand what it is you're trying to do and whether you will do it or not. So you saw from the driver diagram that our aim was a 15% reduction in mortality in five years. A 15% reduction in mortality in five years. The communities of healthcare workers, particularly the doctors, thought we were mad. Thought we were absolutely mad. I was booed off a stage by 600 critical care doctors in 2008 because they thought it was insanity. But at least they knew what it was. Previously, they didn't know what the aim was. We believe you need a method. We happen to choose a collaborative. That, that's not the, the method. There are lots of methods. And then you need to do that testing thing. This is the model of the collaborative. I don't have time to do it in any detail, but you can look it up. You can, if you just Google breakthrough series collaborative, you will find it and you can have these slides. But you end up bringing people together. The principal thing 
is the learning session at which you bring the workers together and then they do the PDSA cycle, which you've heard a number of people talking about. And that's the testing in the real world. And the model for improvement from IHI and the associates in process improvement is the core method inside that of how you drive that change. What, how, what are you trying to do? How will you know you've done it? And what changes can you make to do it? So what, what did it do? I have just a couple of results to show you. I could show results for the rest of the afternoon, but then Joe would get angry. So I'm just going to show you one or two. So the, one of the simplest interventions to understand, I think, is the surgical checklist. It translates well into any country in the world. I, I, I've been a surgeon for 21 years. I have operated on the wrong piece of the body. I have operated on the wrong patient. I have operated often in the middle of the night and not known people's names who were in the surgical team and they haven't known my name. I have done pretty much every complication you can possibly imagine. And yet a simple airline style checklist that says, is this the right patient? Is it the right side of the body? Is, what's your name and what's your job? And in, all introduce yourselves and don't say you're Professor Leach, say that you're Jason and you're the surgeon and I'm Mary and I'm the anaesthetist and I'm Frank and I'm the scrub nurse and is the x-ray up the right way around? Are the drugs ready and are the drugs correct? A simple checklist that we've now put inside the safety programme and we've got it in every single operating theatre in every single day for every single patient. And we've gone from, actually this graph starts way below 83% at the beginning of the safety programme. And I can't tell you that the next graph is directly related to it. I can tell you that the next graph happened at the same time as it, and it's a 20% reduction in surgical mortality. Now, I don't know if the checklist did that, but nobody else can give me a reasonable explanation of how Scotland reduced its surgical mortality by 20% in two years, other than the checklist. We didn't regulate for the checklist. We didn't shout at anybody. We didn't fire anybody. We didn't send letters about the checklist. We didn't send 400,000 copies of the checklist. We built it into the safety program. We built it into the change and improvement work that was ongoing in the safety program. Now, now there are a few doctors who still won't do the checklist. They will feel the regulatory system, but it's at the end rather than in the beginning. So how has the safety program done in its entirety? We've got about 40 interventions. The surgical checklist is just one of them. And this is our overall mortality reduction across the country. You remember that I wanted 15% well, we got to 12% at the end of 2012. And now we have stretched that aim to be 20% by the end of 2015. There's a secular trend in mortality reduction around the world. Care is improving all the time. So every country pretty much in the world can show a mortality reduction. And this is Scotland's mortality reduction for eight years, from 2002 to 2010. We started the safety program about here in 2008, and we started it in one operating theater on Monday. And then we spread to more and more, and it took us two or three years even to get each of the interventions embedded in each of the hospitals. And then at the beginning, at the beginning of 2010, something happened to our mortality statistics. The reduction in mortality trebled in the last two years. Again, I cannot tell you that that is the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. But if it isn't, I can't tell you what it was, because I don't know what else happened to do that. Care is improving all the time, education is getting better, of course. But something happened in Scotland's culture within its hospitals that has trebled the reduction in mortality. This is what our units now look like. There are results everywhere. There are charts, not just single numbers, but charts over time. Healthcare workers are becoming very literate in this new form of statistics. How to do run charts, how to do statistical process control, and we now have capacity building inside the healthcare system to teach the healthcare workers and the managers how to do that. I stole this slide from IHI. In fact, I may have stolen it from Joe some years ago and given him no credit until today. But this is fundamentally the summary of what we did. You, each bullet is worthy of a lecture on its own, but we got in an aim. We got a very bold aim. We brought people together. We stuck with a method 
a theory, and we included patients and families all the time. It's very difficult to talk about car parking and consultant salaries if you have patients in the room. When the patients are in the room, the conversation completely changes to infection and harm and how you're going to reduce it. So you get the idea. We got facts, we got to the field, we spent a lot of time in the field, and we put a time on it. We now have a safety program across our whole healthcare system, not just the acute setting, which is the one I've described to you. We now have safety programs in maternal and pediatric health. We have a safety program just beginning in primary care, which is a big challenge. And we have the, we think, the only mental health safety program in the world, looking at safety within community mental health provision, which is proving very interesting and very interesting to other countries who are very keen to learn from it. So we now think we have a safety program covering all the patients' journeys throughout our healthcare system. So do I have five more minutes? Yes, I have five more minutes. So I'm going to expand back to Lucy and Lewis to finish. So we proved our method inside the safety program. We proved that you could do it. We proved that you could bring people together and they would work on a single issue. But we only proved it inside the healthcare system. 153,000 employees. And we proved that you can do this change inside the healthcare system. The next challenge is to try and do it outside the healthcare system with all of the agencies that access Lucy and Lewis's life. And what we're now trying to do is fix the early years. Evidence says that children, by the time they even get to a year old, have already had many of the major influencers that are going to affect the rest of their lives, be it attachment with their mother, attachment with their father, be it abuse, be it nobody answering them when they cry, what anxiety induced when they're very small babies. So trying to fix all of that. And Scotland has massive inequalities in its provision and its outcomes. We have 15-year discrepancies in mortality within four miles in my city where I live. You can walk four miles and the population dies 15 years younger. And much of that inequality is based on what happens in the first five years of life. So we're trying a brand new thing called the Early Years Collaborative. And this is our ambition. You'll recognize the sequence of events that we've used in safety. This is our ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. We managed to persuade them this time to be even bolder than they were in the safety program. So we had politicians, our first minister, so our chief politician, stand up and say Scotland would be the best place in the world to grow up. And then it took a long time. This next slide doesn't show you the sweat and blood and scars that we have to get to numerical aims. But we have three how much by when aims. The first one is infant mortality. 600 children die a year, die in their first year of life in Scotland. 600 children a year in their first year of life. 300 stillbirths and 300 die of something in their first 12 months. Not all of them are preventable, but many of them are. 25% of pregnant women in the bottom socioeconomic group in Scotland smoke when they're pregnant, for instance. So that's one thing we could work on. Lots of other things in there about nutrition, about breastfeeding, about all kinds of other things. The second one is about developmental milestones at 30 months. Every child will have met their appropriate developmental milestones by 30 months, 85% of them. And then 90% of children will be ready to learn when they get to school. And there's a way of assessing that readiness to learn when the children get to school. This is not a healthcare problem. This is a healthcare problem, a justice problem, an addiction problem, an education problem. It's everybody. It's the whole public and private sector of the nation gathered around a single priority that, is a, that has a very bold aim. And it has begun to catch the imagination of the parliament, of the civil society, of the organizations that would have to align around this, and we've chosen to do it inside a collaborative. But it's multi-agency. It's hugely challenging. There are so many leaders that it's difficult to know in your diary who to prioritize and how to do it. So we're trying to build an infrastructure around that. But let me bring it to its absolute granular frontline change. This is inside a nursery school that looks after kids from birth to four years old when their parents are at work. What they want to do is increase bedtime reading for those children, to make sure those children get a bedtime story before they go to bed. Because the evidence says 
Children who get a bedtime story will be more attached to their parents or their carers. They will be smarter when they grow up. They will have a love for books and for reading when they grow up. Is that going to change my infant mortality number? No. It's not going to go anywhere near my infant mortality number. Because you'd have to do this in every single nursery across the whole nation. And that's what we're going to try and do. And this is one single nursery with no Excel spreadsheet, no fancy computers. It's a piece of scrap paper and a felt pen stuck on the wall in the office of the worker inside this nursery school. And she introduced an intervention, which is a teddy bear that she gives to the children. And it's to remind the parents when the teddy is with the child that the child needs a bedtime story. It's a simple reminder intervention called Bedtime Bear. It costs almost no money. And it moved in a week. It moved the number of children who were getting a bedtime story by 10%. And this graph has continued to rise. Now, I don't, that doesn't need reported in a fancy document or in a computer or in a fancy measurement system. It's a piece of scrap paper on the wall inside a nursery school. You could do that anywhere in the world. Just so you can have the slides, you can have the, these links to the, some of the documents I've talked about if you wish to read more. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy to uh, speak to any of you who want to learn more, particularly about the early years work, which is my most exciting thing that I have going on just now. I, I hope that might be how you felt. I, I hope we would this afternoon create some enthusiasm in you, at least willing to take some risk. I showed this to a, a room of about 600 people recently, and there was a row of people at the end asking me questions. And there was a very earnest gentleman who was very concerned about this slide. And I didn't really understand why. I thought he might be going to give me into trouble for the slight swearing at the end of it. I thought that's maybe what I was going to get, but it wasn't that. He was very concerned that I, it w my natural history was poor because penguins and polar bears are never on the same ice cap, he told me. I, I suggested to him that that probably wasn't the major problem with the photograph. One of the penguins had symbols. I didn't think that happened in the natural world, but he didn't really understand the humor. So. He he was trying to persuade me that I shouldn't ever show it again, but I've rejected him. Thank you very much for listening. Muito obrigado, Jason. É, fantástico entusiasmo do Jason. Espero que nós todos tenhamos sido contaminados por esse entusiasmo. E muito interessante a, a abordagem da segurança, das questões de segurança, como é que elas se misturam com o objetivo do sistema de saúde como um todo, e como uma sociedade que se quer construir solidária e equitativa. Muito obrigado, Jason. Muito obrigado. Bem, agora mudamos para o nosso continente. É, eu convidaria a Odete, do México, a compartilhar conosco a aventura mexicana. Thank you very much, Dr. Noronha, for the invitation, as well as the Ministry of Health. And uh, Dr. Mendez, thank you very much for the invitation and the honor to be here with you. Uh, they told me I can make my presentation in Spanish, so I will do it in Spanish. I hope this won't be a trouble. <laughs> okay. Bueno, eh, la jornada de, de historia de México, digamos, en lo que fue lo, eh, la Cruzada Nacional por la Calidad, donde empezó realmente el programa de seguridad del paciente hace ya varios años, es eh, lo que les voy a traer esta tarde. La siguiente, por favor. Ah, aquí. Para ponernos en contexto, en México eh, somos 118 millones de habitantes, eh, la mitad más o menos mujeres, la mitad hombres, en una extensión de 2 millones de kilómetros cuadrados, bastante menos que Brasil y también en, en, en habitantes, y nosotros algo similar con ustedes es que tenemos 32 entidades federativas, que son los estados que ustedes tienen, de los cuales son 31 estados y un distrito federal, yo vivo en el distrito federal como Brasilia, también en México tenemos un distrito federal. En ese sentido es eh, un poco similar la manera en cómo está dividido el país. El sistema mexicano es muy complejo, eh, el, eh, la atención médica se da en varios, eh, por varias instituciones, no es una sola, no nada más es el Ministerio de Salud y la parte privada. Eh, la Secretaría de Salud o el Ministerio de Salud, como lo llaman acá, es eh, la regula el, quien hace la regulación en nuestro país. 
Sin embargo, eh, la atención que provee la Secretaría de Salud o el Ministerio de Salud es a la gente que no tiene ningún otro tipo de seguridad social. Esta es la Secretaría de Salud. Pero también tenemos, por ejemplo, lo que es el IMSS, que es el Instituto Mexicano de Seguridad Social, que le da la seguridad a todos los trabajadores eh, de empresas privadas y demás. Tiene una parte de seguridad social que es, eh, por un lado, el patrón eh, aporta una cantidad, por otro lado, el trabajador aporta otra cantidad y así es como se les da la atención, cubre medicamentos y cubren todos los padecimientos. Eh, lo que es el ISTE, que es de los servidores públicos, o sea, todo lo, todos los trabajadores del Estado reciben la atención médica por parte del ISTE y también tiene cubiertos todos los padecimientos y todos los medicamentos. La Secretaría de Salud, como yo les comentaba, es para quienes no tienen derecho a la salud. El problema es que solamente cubre ciertos padecimientos al 100% con medicamentos. El resto de los padecimientos sí los cubre, pero en muchas ocasiones los pacientes tienen que pagar la parte de medicamentos y la parte de otros insumos como prótesis y este tipo de cosas. Entonces, la equidad ahí tenemos un poquito de problema, o bueno, mucho problema. Sedena es quien da la atención a los militares, ellos tienen cubierto todo también. Semar es la, la de los marinos, también tienen cubierto todos. Eh, todo, Pemex también es eh, la parte de petróleos mexicanos, todos sus trabajadores tienen cubiertos todos sus padecimientos. Entonces, como ven, está muy fraccionada, aparte está por supuesto lo privado, que es el desembolso de, de la gente que quiera pagar un seguro privado o un hospital privado. Entonces, tenemos una fragmentación tremenda en, en, dentro del país. Estamos trabajando para lo que es la... Eh, la congruencia de, de todos estos microsistemas en uno solo, con una portabilidad, que una persona que se atiende en el ISTE puede ir al IMSS en una emergencia. Ahorita, en lo que está funcionando en este momento es con el programa de mortalidad materna, en donde cualquier mujer que llegue al hospital que sea, de la institución que sea, se le tiene que dar la atención y luego entre las instituciones hacen cuentas de cómo pagar cada una de las atenciones que se le dio a esta mujer, porque es una prioridad nacional evitar la mortalidad materna. Y es un ejemplo y, y se va a ir eh, propagando en, 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 otros, en otras enfermedades para ir haciendo esta integración del sistema de salud mexicano. Es algo muy complejo, pero es en donde partimos. Entonces, meter una iniciativa a nivel nacional de calidad y seguridad del paciente en instituciones tan separadas que cada una tiene sus iniciativas es un poco complicado, pero sí creo que hemos avanzado en algo algunas cosas, solo quería ponerlos en contexto. Esta es una línea del tiempo, desde lo que fue el año 2000, cuando entró la Cruzada Nacional por la Calidad, hasta el año 2013, que es donde estamos eh, ahora, en donde vamos a ir eh, viendo las diferentes iniciativas que hubo a nivel internacional y en México, cómo, cómo fue avanzando. Eh, primero, bueno, como ustedes saben, en el 99-2000 se publicó el libro Errar es Humano, que fue el parteaguas, digamos, en, a nivel internacional en lo que fue la seguridad del paciente. Inició en el 2000-2001, empezaron ya los eh, trabajos en sí de la Cruzada Nacional por la Calidad de la Atención a la Salud, que fue diseñada y puesta en marcha por el doctor Enrique Ruelas, que todos ustedes o muchos de ustedes deben de conocer, es un erudito en materia de calidad y más en mi país. Eh, posteriormente, bueno, se hizo la Asamblea Mundial, de, eh, Asamblea Mundial de la Salud de la OMS en el 2002 y nosotros empezamos con manuales de crisis en seguridad del paciente. Tuvimos un problema muy grave en Comitán, un país en Chiap un eh, pueblito en Chiapas, en uno de los estados, en donde se murieron varios niños por infecciones intrahospitalarias en un cunero, porque era la época de Navidad, todo el mundo salía de vacaciones, se concentraron todos los niños, muchos nacieron fuera y como no había suficientes incubadoras, los pusieron a muchos juntos y entonces se propagó la infección, se murieron muchos. Entonces, a raíz de esto, eh, se hizo este, este manual de seguridad, en, de crisis en seguridad del paciente. Iniciamos lo que fue la sensibilización en materia de seguridad del paciente, ya les voy a, a hablar un poquito más a fondo de esto. Eh, se instalaron las 10 acciones en materia de seguridad que van de la mano de lo que hoy se conoce como metas internacionales, pero son 10 acciones, son cuatro eh, puntos más, uno es en cultura, de, eh, de seguridad, otros de factores humanos, la otra parte es incluir al paciente y lo que son las guías de práctica clínica. Eh, posteriormente, en la, asamblea, en la 57 Asamblea Mundial de la Salud, se creó la Alianza Mundial por la Seguridad del Paciente, 
En México empezamos, empezamos a hacer difusión del conocimiento a través de boletines a nivel nacional en todas las instituciones. Eh, se desarrollaron algunos indicadores de seguridad que tenían que estar reportando a la Secretaría de Salud. Se hizo un sistema nacional de registro y aprendizaje que ya vamos a hablar un poquito más adelante de eventos adversos. Se hicieron algunos protocolos de investigación y el IMSS sacó un programa de vencer que es muy similar al al del de Sistema Nacional de Registro de Eventos Adversos. Eh, después salió el primer reto de atención limpia, es una atención más segura por parte de la Organización Mundial de la Salud. Eh, en México se hizo una firma con varios países eh, a, este, a este pledge, a este… lo bueno es que iba a hablar en español… Eh, se firmó esta declaración con varios países y se incluyó el tema en el Programa Nacional de Salud con el, ya con el nuevo gobierno, o sea, estos son los primeros seis años, con el nuevo gobierno en el que ya estaban incluidos nuevamente lo que era la calidad y la seguridad del paciente. Posteriormente salió el segundo reto mundial eh, de la salud, eh, de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, la cirugía segura salvavidas y se forma la Red Panamericana de Pacientes por la Seguridad del Paciente, eh, nosotros nos, nos unimos a este segundo compromiso de la OMS, se hizo el programa sectorial en el que incluía eh, calidad y seguridad del paciente, se mantenía, se hizo la campaña Está en tus manos, que va de la mano de lo que es higiene de manos, se terminó con el estudio IBEAS, eh, se incluyeron no, nuevos indicadores de calidad y seguridad del paciente en el proceso de acreditación y certificación de México y se formaliza la Red Mexicana de Pacientes por la Seguridad del Paciente. Eh, posteriormente, bueno, el Consejo de la Unión Europea saca algunas recomendaciones en seguridad del paciente, ya estamos en 2009, y en 2010 se incluye la materia de seguridad del paciente en, en lo que es pregrado, y en México, bueno, pues se eh, homologaron los criterios de certificación de México con los de Joint Commission, por parte del, del Consejo de Salubridad General, eh, en lo que es la cirugía bariátrica, se incluyen estos nuevos indicadores para poder hacer una cirugía bariátrica segura dentro del proceso de acreditación. Y bueno, se presentan los resultados del IBEAS. Como ven, tardamos un poquito en obtener los resultados, pero creo que valió mucho la pena. Eh, se crea un sistema de registro de eventos adversos por parte de la Comisión Nacional eh, de Arbitraje Médico en México, que es, es un órgano que está hecho para que los pacientes, en caso de tener alguna inconformidad, acu acudan con ellos y se hace un estudio para ver qué es lo que realmente pasó y evitar demandas y satisfacer la demanda del paciente. Entonces, bueno, este sistema pasó a, a sustituir el primero que, que se lanzó por parte de la Secretaría de Salud y bueno, inicia eh, la materia de calidad y seguridad del, del paciente en materia de pregrado en la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México como una materia optativa y en algunas otras universidades privadas de, ma de manera eh, obligatoria. Y bueno, actualmente está un curso virtual en calidad y seguridad del paciente por parte del Ministerio de Salud de México y el nuevo programa se llama PROCES, que está eh, enfocado a lo que es la calidad efectiva en los servicios de salud. Entonces, bueno, vamos a ir eh, por año, más o menos viendo qué fue, qué, cuáles fueron todas estas iniciativas. Esto es un eslogan de lo que fue en, en su momento la Cruzada Nacional por la Calidad y, y de, de Salud, en, en donde, bueno, pues la S significaba seguridad, ¿no? Y, y pasaba por lo que es la efectividad, la eficiencia, la ética, el respeto, la información, la amabilidad. Eh, varios puntos que incluía la Cruzada Nacional y que debo de decir que muchos de ellos continúan todavía vigentes dentro de eh, lo que es la estrategia nacional, como puede ser algo muy innovador lo, lo que fue en su momento el aval ciudadano, que continúa siendo eh, un, un instrumento valioso en el que los ciudadanos avalan la práctica de la medicina en los hospitales, tanto públicos como privados, pero más en los, en los públicos. Estos son los 10 pasos que desarrollamos en aquel momento para lo que es eh, el manejo de crisis en materia de seguridad, porque no es lo mismo, bueno, debe de haber un vocero único, etcétera, en el momento en que ocurre un evento adverso y, y no eh, que se disperse la información y lo único que crea es caos y confusión. Este es el logotipo que desarrollamos en materia de seguridad del paciente, que lo que quería eh, mostrar es la, la responsabilidad tripartita 
entre lo que es la institución o el sistema de salud, en lo que es eh, por parte de los pacientes, ellos también tienen una responsabilidad, y lo que es el prestador de servicios, y bueno, es una persona que está abrazando a otra, que es dándole la seguridad, y está en amarillo porque es prevención, ¿no? el ámbar nos da como prevención, entonces ese era el mensaje que queríamos nosotros transmitir. Algo Bien importante eh, desde nuestro punto de vista es el hecho de sensibilizar a la gente antes de meter iniciativas o antes de meter esfuerzos como, por ejemplo, la medición de eventos adversos. Uno tiene que sembrar en, en, en terreno fértil y la gente tiene que estar convencida de que ese es el camino, por eso es, es el dibujo. Nosotros eh, nos dimos un tiempo eh, suficiente en, en todo el país para poder llevar a los prestadores de servicio lo que era la calidad y la seguridad, sobre todo la seguridad del paciente, antes de empezar de lleno con iniciativas de regulación, etcétera. Porque de lo contrario vamos a, a tener eh, un rechazo probablemente de qué es lo que me vienes a medir si yo hago muy bien todas las cosas. ¿no? Entonces creo que es importante tomarse el tiempo para hacer esa, esa sensibilización antes de empezar con iniciativas que pueden llegar a ser un poco eh, agresivas, como es la medición de eventos adversos. Bueno, este, este es el, hicimos un, unos cursos talleres en materia de seguridad en donde invitábamos a un director de cada uno de los estados de hospital junto con todo su staff, pero también tenía que ir gente operativa, tenía que ir enfermeras eh, operativas, tenían que ir el director del hospital, por supuesto, el director administrativo, porque muchas veces no nos entienden que la compra de los insumos tiene que ir de acuerdo a las necesidades de los usuarios y no al costo, porque muchas veces los administradores te compran punzocats o diferente tipo de equipo de acuerdo a los costos o hacen una licitación o lo que sea y, y en muchas ocasiones es mejor que te compren algo que sea un poco más caro, que te va a durar más o que pone en menor riesgo a los pacientes. Entonces tenía que estar el de administración ahí, tenía que estar enfermería, tenía que estar eh, el de urgencias, tenía que estar el jefe de urgencias, el jefe de terapia intensiva y el de quirófano, que son como los puntos foco, los focos rojos que eh, tenemos que tener ahí para poder hacer una adecuada intervención. Y bueno, a ellos los capacitábamos. Estas son las 10 acciones en materia de calidad y seguridad del paciente que ya mencioné. Eh, posteriormente hicimos una difusión enorme de lo que calidad y la seguridad del paciente a nivel nacional a través de boletines trimestrales, en donde cada eh, trimestre les mandábamos un tema diferente, poníamos ejercicios y todo y lo distribuimos a nivel nacional para que la gente empe empezara a, a crear la cultura de seguridad. Este es el sistema de registro de eventos adversos. En ese momento en el que se hizo, no sabíamos nada realmente de qué estaba pasando, cuál era el problema en nuestro país y tampoco era una manera muy adecuada de aproximarse, porque lo único que te ayuda este tipo de sistemas es a crear cultura, la cultura del reporte, pero en realidad nunca te va a decir el tamaño del problema. El tamaño del problema te lo dice un estudio como el IBEAS, por ejemplo. Esa es, esa es una experiencia que yo o, sí les diría no es tan útil un sistema de registro de eventos adversos voluntario, la verdad, pero bueno. Es eh, un ejercicio en el que eh, este sistema de, de eventos adversos, cómo nos iban reportando cada vez más casos, cada vez más casos, cómo eh, se va incrementando el número de casos, era un logro cada vez que alguien eh, nos, nos registraba algún evento adverso, porque eso quiere decir que tienen la confianza suficiente para compartirlo a nivel nacional, este es un ejercicio de 2004 a 2006, en donde vemos el tipo de eventos adversos que nos reportaban y una comparación entre, un, entre dos hospitales, pero no te, no te dicen más esos, esos datos. Posteriormente, en 2005, se hizo un estudio en el Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Respiratorias, en donde encontraron eh, la prevalencia de eventos adversos en un 9.1%. Eh, aquí están el tipo de de eventos, tratamiento insuficiente e inadecuado, complicaciones quirúrgicas, infecciones adquiridas, retraso en el diagnóstico, reacción a medicamentos, caída de pacientes. Y bueno, la buena noticia de este estudio es que el 74% eran prevenibles, muy similar a lo que, a lo que encontró Claudia en su estudio eh, aquí en Brasil. Ahí ya la encontré, Claudia está allá. 
Posteriormente se hizo otro estudio en la Subsecretaría de Innovación y Calidad de aquel entonces, en donde se encontraron un 11.8% de prevalencia de eventos adversos, pero igual fueron únicamente dos hospitales que estuvieron trabajando en este estudio, en donde bueno, los problemas más eh, grandes que encontramos fue la neumonía adquirida, la infección de herida quirúrgica, infección por procedimientos médicos. Esta es la firma del convenio con la OMS, en donde estuvieron participando Cuba, República Dominicana, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua y Panamá, por supuesto México, y fue el 21 de septiembre de 2007. Se hizo un evento muy bonito en el Museo de Antropología de, de, de la Ciudad de México. Fue algo muy lindo porque ver tantos países eh, confluir en una misma meta. Y bueno, pues este es el estudio IBEAS en el 2007 en donde efectivamente eh, trabajamos Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, México y Perú. Eh, les voy a mostrar los resultados de México, Itziar ya dio los de eh, el IBEAS en conjunto, yo les voy a mostrar únicamente los, los de México. Nos salió un 8% de prevalencia de eventos adversos. El tipo de eventos adversos en México estuvo al revés que en el IBEAS, era más... El problema era más grave en los relacionados con procedimientos, seguido de lo que eran las infecciones intrahospitalarias, y después venían otros como reacciones eh, relacionados con los cuidados y relacionados con medicamentos o con el diagnóstico. Otra vez la, la buena noticia, este estudio ya se hizo en 28 eh, hospitales dentro de la República, de los 32 estados, en 28 estados y lo, la buena noticia es que eran evitables estos eventos en el 62% de los casos. La gravedad, como lo mencionó Itziar, eh, teníamos un, un, una grande eh, proporción de eventos relacionados con la muerte o que provocaron la muerte misma, el 2% como es en los estudios internacionales, con una incapacidad absoluta del 18% es gravísimo y severa en un 13%. Y pues bueno, nuevamente la prevención. Ahora, ¿a quiénes son a quienes les estamos haciendo mayor daño? Esto, este es un dato eh, importante. El 30.3% es en menores de, de un año de edad y por otro lado tenemos a los que están en la edad productiva del país. Entonces, les estamos haciendo un boquete económico muy importante, por un lado al futuro de, de, de nuestro país y por otro lado a la gente que está siendo más productiva. ¿no? Entonces, es un problema serio en ese sentido. Ahora, en cuanto a estancia hospitalaria, también causó reingresos en un 17.6% de los pacientes en 15.2 días. Si esto lo multiplicamos por el costo eh, del día cama en un hospital, son muchos millones de pesos o dólares que podrían estar siendo utilizados en tantas otras cosas. Y pues bueno, como les mencionaba, eh, para nosotros era muy importante que confluyeran todos los, eh, todos los actores dentro de lo que es la, eh, no nada más la Secretaría de Salud, sino también el IMSS y el ISTE. Este es el lanzamiento de la campaña Está en tus manos, que viene... Eh, de, de, la, de la iniciativa de OMS de higiene de manos y aquí está el secretario de salud en aquella época, el director del IMSS y el director del ISTE, que son las tres grandes, eh, digamos, figuras dentro de lo que es el sistema eh, mexicano de salud. Y pues bueno, ahí están los cinco momentos también, lo que es la higiene de manos, los cinco momentos. Eh, también se hizo otro estudio en el 2008 con, con la Comisión Nacional de Arbitraje Médico, que ya les comentaba hace un momento, en donde se vio que eh, al 60% de los pacientes que presentan una queja ante la CONAMED, eh, no se les dice la verdad, o sea que la cultura todavía no es la adecuada cuando ocurre un evento adverso. En el 2008, como eh, mencioné hace un momento, el 6 de octubre fue fundada la Red Mexicana de Pacientes por la Seguridad del Paciente. Algo muy importante es involucrar a los pacientes y sus familiares en esta iniciativa. En el 2008-2009 salió lo que es la lista de cotejo en materia de seguridad, que son buenas prácticas, igual que el primer reto mundial, que ya está comprobando que el comprobado que el simple hecho de aplicarla, como ya nos comentaba James, hacen una mejora en lo que es los eventos adversos en, en, en la atención a la salud. 
Eh, les mencionaba la parte de acreditación y certificación. Estos son los estándares de certificación en, en México, bueno, la portada de los estándares, que fue homologada en 2009 a, a los criterios de Joint Commission. En México hay dos eh, acreditaciones. Por un lado está la certificación, que es voluntaria, que es esta, que es por parte del Consejo de Salubridad General. Y por otro lado está la acreditación, que es por parte del Ministerio de Salud. Esa no es eh, voluntaria, es obligatoria para quien quiera acceder al dinero del Seguro Popular. Esta es una manera de, de eh, en cierta forma, regular la, la práctica de la atención médica, porque en los estados de la República lo que quieren los secretarios de salud y los directores de hospitales siempre es dinero, tristemente, pero lo que, eh, por lo que van detrás es por el presupuesto. Entonces, el Seguro Popular fue creado por la Secretaría de Salud para eh, cubrir ciertos padecimientos que les mencionaba yo hace un momento, ciertos padecimientos que sí tienen tanto medicamentos como todo el proceso de atención, como puede ser cáncer, leucemias, ese tipo de, de, de situaciones, algunos trasplantes, etc. Entonces, para tener acceso a ese, a ese presupuesto, tienen que estar acreditados por la Secretaría de Salud para prestar ese servicio, si no, no te van a soltar el dinero. Es una, man es un, es una manera de cerrar la pinza, de decir, tienes que hacer las cosas bien, porque tiene que cumplir con los criterios de acreditación para ese padecimiento. Por ejemplo, dentro de esos criterios puede ir que tengan una campaña de higiene de manos instalada en el hospital, que cumplan con ciertos estándares mínimos para la atención para ese padecimiento. Entonces, uno de ahí se va agarrando para que vaya subiendo el nivel de calidad de los eh, hospitales públicos. Ahora, en, en los hospitales privados, la manera en cómo se ha logrado, la del Ministerio me está poniendo atención, es que es una, es una buena fórmula, la verdad. En, en la parte de, de, de los públicos, como se hizo la pinza, fue se hizo un convenio con lo que son eh, la Asociación Mexicana de Instituciones eh, de, Seguri, de Seguros Privados, AMIS se llama. Entonces, hizo un convenio con ellos en que ellos no le iban a pagar a ningún hospital eh, privado eh, sus pacientes que fueran vistos en hospitales que no estuvieran certificados por el consejo. Entonces, pues pregúntenme qué porcentaje de hospitales están más certificados, si públicos o privados. ¿Es voluntario? Pues por supuesto los privados, porque tienen esto de que no les van a pagar las aseguradoras si no están certificados por el Consejo. Y es otra manera de eh, jugar con esta parte de regulación. Bueno, esta es la versión web de lo que le llaman CIRAIS, que es de la Comisión Nacional de Arbitraje Médico, que es un sistema en línea en donde se reportan los eventos adversos de manera voluntaria por diferentes hospitales y en automático les da una eh, respuesta sobre las acciones que deben de implementar para mejorar ese tipo de eventos adversos. Y bueno, dando un, un brinco un poquito algo diferente, algo a lo que queremos apostarle es al futuro, ¿no? al futuro de las nuevas eh, generaciones. Y aquí se hizo un proyecto de mejora de supervisión del personal en formación. Esto se hizo en un hospital eh, pu eh, público. Y bueno, ¿por qué, lo, ¿por qué lo decidimos hacer? Esta es una lámina en donde viene... Eh, un blog de un médico interno de pregrado, o sea, antes de que, de que se gradúen, que empieza a hacer sus prácticas dentro de un hospital en donde, dice, donde explica qué es lo que significa ser el primero en llegar al hospital como interno y el último en irse y no tener ni idea de cómo hacer todo lo que tiene que hacer porque no le han dado toda la práctica adecuada y los miedos que él sufre en ese momento para poder eh, dar la, la, la atención. Y bueno, eh, se despide diciendo, ya solo me quedan 122 guardas para, guardias para terminar el año que me queda para hacer este tipo de cosas. Y bueno, en realidad, ¿qué tipo de, de médicos queremos nosotros hacer? El, el típico médico, lo voy a leer para que se los traduzcan en donde dice, doctor, hace una semana que no como, no duermo, no tomo agua, ¿qué cree que tenga? Pues tiene hambre, sueño y sed. Le está diciendo la verdad, ¿no? Pero bueno, en realidad no es este el tipo de médicos que nosotros queremos este, llevar a, eh, bueno, que crezcan dentro de nuestros sistemas. ¿no? Tampoco queremos crear médicos que se sientan muy arrepentidos de lo que hicieron, como el video que nos pasaban antes de, el doctor Noroña, antes de empezar esta, esta conferencia, en donde se equivoca y tiene que asumir eh, la culpa de, de, de los errores que está cometiendo. 
Entonces, pues este tampoco es el tipo de médicos. El tipo de médicos que nosotros queremos hacer, estos son dos médicos mexicanos muy renombrados, con una historia y una trayectoria eh, enorme. Uno es el maestro Subirán, que es el fundador del instituto en el cual laboro yo hoy, y este es el maestro Chávez, que es el, eh, el fundador de lo que es el Instituto Nacional de Cardiología en México. Y bueno, ellos han eh, formado a su vez médicos que hoy, ellos dos, los dos primeros ya fallecieron, pero los que están abajo eh, todavía están con nosotros y son muy renombrados. Él es el doctor David Kersenovich, mi actual jefe, que es el mejor hepatólogo de México y puedo decir que de muchos lugares del mundo. El doctor Ruiz Palacios, que también es un investigador de alto renombre en México. Y el doctor Guadalajara, que además fue mi maestro, que es un eh, estupendo cardiólogo. Son gente verdaderamente extraordinaria como clínicos, como médicos, ¿no? Y también tenemos gente como el doctor Ruelas, que ha estado trabajando y creando mucha gente en, en, en formación en lo que es la calidad y la seguridad del, del paciente. Entonces, lo que queremos es tener este tipo de, de personajes con nuestro sistema para que las nuevas generaciones puedan empujar al sistema que sea mejor y tener una atención multidisciplinaria. Entonces, bueno, este estudio o este proyecto que hicimos en México fue un hospital de 289 camas, público, de tercer nivel, eh, se invitó a participar a 500 profesionales de la salud vinculados con lo que es la supervisión de la atención médica eh, de la, del personal en formación. Tuvimos una respuesta de eh, 391 cuestionarios, el 78% nos respondió y al final una respuesta de eh, 429, un 85.8%. ¿Qué es lo que hicimos? Pues hicimos un cuestionario sobre incentivos. ¿Qué les motivaría a estas personas que están bajo supervisión de los chicos a que lo, a que lo hicieran mejor? Yo esperaba otra cosa, les debo de ser honesta, yo esperaba que, que pidieran algo distinto. Pero bueno, lo que pidieron fue económico, un, 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 un incentivo económico fue lo que pidieron. No sé por qué me sigo sorprendiendo, pero es la realidad. Entonces, bueno, esa fue una de nuestras herramientas, este cuestionario sobre qué tipo de incentivos eh, des desearían, un cuestionario de clima de seguridad del paciente modificado del DHRQ. Hicimos, desarrollamos un decálogo para hacer una mini campaña dentro del hospital de lo que es eh, la atención eh, de la salud. Eh, cinco acciones en seguridad para profesores, cinco acciones para, de seguridad para el personal en formación, uno va de la mano del otro, y una bitácora de procedimientos en donde cada vez que uno de los residentes o internos hacía un procedimiento, eh, tenía que checar estos puntos y su supervisor le tenía que firmar eh, lo, que, lo, que tenían, eh, lo que estaba supervisando. Entonces, bueno, pues este es el, es el personal dentro del hospital que participó. La población encuestada, pues bueno, el 41.69% de, de, del personal eh, participó con un índice, índice de confiabilidad del 95% y pues bueno, dentro de este cuestionario lo que salió fue, lo que querían era un incentivo positivo que fuera económico y que fuera escalonado, es decir, que se diera un incentivo al mejor supervisor un incentivo al mejor eh, servicio de, del hospital que, que quisiera mejor supervisión y un incentivo al hospital, es decir, escalonado. Este es el decálogo en, en el que está basado en tres valores, la responsabilidad, la honestidad y el conocimiento. Entonces, bueno, pues aquí está el bienestar de mis pacientes y su seguridad son mi prioridad. Fomento que el personal en formación otorgue una atención médica segura. Aseguro que los pacientes, colegas, el personal en formación y demás trabajadores de la salud entiendan mis indicaciones e información relevante sobre mis pacientes. Tengo disposición para contestar dudas a pacientes y colegas y personal en formación. Tomo en cuenta factores humanos como el cansancio y la prisa para prevenir eventos adversos y garantizar una atención segura. Hablo con la verdad a los pacientes, colegas, personal en formación y demás trabajadores. Admito mis errores y busco la manera de evitar eh, cometerlos nuevamente. No culpo a otros por mis errores. Mi práctica clínica la hago siempre tomando como referencia la medicina basada en la evidencia. Si tengo alguna duda sobre un diagnóstico, tratamiento o procedimiento de un paciente, investigo y solicito apoyo a profesionales con mayor experiencia. Es mucho de honestidad. Bueno, este es eh, para profesores, eh, eh, sus acciones en seguridad y para los eh, estudiantes. 
¿no? en donde bueno, básicamente eh, sigo las tareas que me han asignado, conozco el límite de mis habilidades, porque muchas veces cuando estás en formación y te piden hacer un procedimiento y tú ya tienes, no, no sé, eres R2, estás en el año 2 de la residencia y es algo que deberías de saber, por pena puedes decir no, por pena puedes hacerlo y poner en riesgo al paciente. Entonces, bueno, esto va de la mano de, si estás en formación, tienes todo el derecho de preguntar cuántas veces sea necesario para evitar eh, algún problema de seguridad. ¿no? Eh, antes de realizar un procedimiento o supervisarlo, siempre eh, repaso con mi superior la técnica, los riesgos, los datos de alarma. ¿no? Eh, al terminar los procedimientos, repaso las indicaciones, los datos de alarma, el plan de acción y doy seguimiento a la evaluación de los pacientes, etc. Entonces, pues bueno, les hicimos unos gafetitos para que trajeran el decálogo y las acciones. Esta es la bitácora que tenían que firmarles sus supervisores para ver que lo estuvieran haciendo. Y pues bueno, ¿en qué resultó esto? Pues el nivel de cumplimiento de supervisión en procedimientos y médicos pasó de un 17% a un 70%. O sea, en realidad, si no lo pones en el tintero, la gente da por hecho que los residentes y los internos están haciendo las cosas. En vez de, de, de poner, siempre tiene que estar acompañado de un supervisor. Entonces, en este sentido creo que fue benéfico. Se hicieron de un total de 3.165 procedimientos re registrados, realizados por el, por el personal en formación en, en un periodo de tres meses, fueron supervisados el 94%. Si sí hubo complicaciones en un 3% de los eh, procedimientos, el total de médicos supervisados fueron 240 y el total de médicos en formación fueron 122. Y bueno, el tipo de, de eh, complicaciones que hubo fue, por ejemplo, una lesión en pleura, bacteremias y sangrado. Ya casi termino. Okay. Bueno, estos son los resultados de la mejora. ¿no? Y aquí lo único que, que cabe resaltar es que eh, la percepción del clima de seguridad mejoró cuando se pone en la muestra a los residentes, porque realmente nunca los toman en cuenta. ¿no? Y pues bueno, este es el, el resultado del, del estudio. Eh, se entregó escalonado el servicio que ganó Fotorrino y la doctora que ganó fue eh, una oftalmóloga. Y posteriormente en 2011 se hizo la bacteremia cero, y ya para terminar, en lo que está ahorita México, este es el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo del presidente Peña Nieto. En este punto, en el número 12, es donde está incluido lo que es calidad y seguridad del paciente. En el, en el eje México incluyente, el objetivo es garantizar el ejercicio efectivo de los derechos sociales a todos los mexicanos. Lo que hablaba ICIAR de la universalización del sistema, pues está aquí. Y la estrategia es garantizar el acceso efectivo a servicios de salud de calidad. Entonces, pues bueno, hay que poner todos los esfuerzos en conjunto y no que cada quien esté jalando para un lado. Y finalmente, para concluir, yo creo que un programa exitoso debe de tener la voluntad política, debe de tener el desarrollo de cultura a favor de la calidad y la seguridad del paciente, hacer énfasis en lo que es la investigación para poder tener datos adecuados, considerar invertir en las nuevas generaciones y el compromiso tiene que ser tripartita entre el sistema, entre el personal de salud y entre los pacientes. Y no se desalienten, sí se puede lograr, y aquí hay un, una frase de un premio Nobel de la Paz que dice… Lo difícil toma tiempo, pero lo imposible es un poquito más de tiempo, pero sí se puede. Gracias. Muito obrigado, Adete. É, 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 vimos agora uma experiência num país diverso, continental muito parecido com o Brasil, com muitas instituições. Ainda não tem o SUS mas também tem a multiplicidade institucional que coloca desafios muito grandes. Eu chamaria apenas a atenção para, para aqui o Brasil o uso das palavras certificação e acreditação que eles empregam de uma maneira distinta da inscrição habitualmente empregados aqui no Brasil. É bom ter isso em conta é, quando é, é, trabalhamos juntos. Estão, esses conceitos era bom clarear o que é certificação. Que nós consideramos a acreditação como voluntária, a certificação como é, é, eventualmente mandatório, licenciamento quando é requisito para o funcionamento do serviço. Bem, é, agora teremos o prazer de ouvir, como eu falei, Joe McCann, ele trabalhou no Centro Medicare, Service, Medicare and Medicaid Services nos Estados Unidos, eu recebi uma pequena nota, também trabalhou no Institute of Healthcare Improvement e agora trabalha com amplas organizações globais, 
é, em saúde, além do campo da saúde, incluindo a Fundação Bill and Melinda Gates. É, é um prazer muito grande. Muito obrigado, Joe, por estar entre nós. Bom. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and uh, thank you to our hosts, and thank you to all of you for uh, giving me a chance to be with you for a few moments here today. Uh, I realize it's a, it's a long day of sitting and listening, for which reason I'll try to move relatively quickly and we can get to some conversation and some, some interaction. But uh, do let me start by saying first congratulations for all of the exciting work you're doing and the exciting work that you're, you're uh, expanding upon here in association with this meeting. Uh, I was here in Brazil in 2007 and, and can certainly see a significant difference in terms of the level of activity and the, the level of commitment when it comes to quality and patient safety in just that, uh, that very short time. Um, and I want to say, too, that I, I'm uh, learning a lot by, by being here, so though I hope to share some, uh, mostly I think I'll probably walk away with more ideas myself from all of you and from my colleagues from different countries here. So uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I was reflecting as I was sitting here earlier that actually my own experience, my own journey with, uh, with patient safety began in uh, 2003. I, at the time, I was... Uh, working and living mainly in, in Africa. Uh, I was working for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, which is a nonprofit organization based in the US, an organization that was started by Don Berwick, uh, who some of you know is a, 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 a strong leader in the fields of quality and patient safety. And um, at the time, I was working with the World Health Organization on something called the 3 by 5 initiative, which was focused on reducing uh, HIV and AIDS, on getting 3 million people onto antiretroviral treatment uh, by the end of the year 2005, uh, which felt to me like the most important work in the world at the time. And I couldn't imagine working on anything else. Uh, and I, I came back to Boston for a visit, and Don Berwick took me aside and said, um, you know, we're going to uh, start a, a national campaign, a national initiative to improve patient safety, uh, and I want to ask you if you'd consider running that initiative. And um, to be polite, I told him I would think about it for a half an hour, uh, but I knew immediately when he asked me that the answer was no. Um, I, I, I wasn't especially interested. I was enjoying the work that I was doing. I didn't really understand patient safety. I, I didn't understand the problem, the scope of it, how serious it was. And so I, I said, thank you very much, but no. Uh, and about two weeks later, he approached me again and said, um, you know, I really think you should think about this initiative we're going to start and the possibility of running this initiative on patient safety. And I, I told him again, you know, thanks, but no thanks. The, the, the arrogance of a 25-year-old, of a I just decided that he didn't really know what he was talking about and I would, I would do what I would do. Uh, and then uh, about two weeks later, he approached me again and he said, you know, I really think you should consider um, taking part in this, this patient safety work. Uh, and I sort of began to read between the lines. I understand that he wasn't really asking me. Um, he was kind of uh, telling me that, that this was what I was going to be doing. I ultimately agreed that I would work on it for three months. I said I would start the initiative. I would launch it and I would work on it for three months. This was an initiative that we called the 100,000 Lives Campaign, which, which focused on reducing 100,000 unnecessary deaths uh, through improvements in patient safety uh, from 2004 to 2006. Uh, little did I know that, that that three months actually sort of was the beginning of the rest of my life. And I became deeply involved in the problem, had several family members in the course of the work who were actually seriously harmed in the course of their care. One of my closest colleagues, uh, the, the person who actually wrote the clinical interventions for the 100,000 Lives campaign, died of a surgical site infection uh, before we finished that first campaign. Uh, and so it, what began as a, as a whim, as a, as a vacation from the work that I was doing in Africa, uh, actually became an area of great personal concern and, and great personal passion for me. And I've, begun to work, I've continued to work on it ever since, most recently at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, as you heard mentioned, uh, we launched a, a $1 billion program called the Partnership for Patients in 2011. Uh, which sought to, to uh, even build the movement further around patient safety in the U.S., and I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail. In any case,
I just wanted to share with you a little bit more about my passion and, and my connection to this work um, and, and say that, you know, it's for this reason that I'm, I'm feeling especially excited and energized to be here because when I think of where we were in 2003 and 2004, uh, I, I can certainly tell you that most of the American public, and I think most of the public in other countries that I visited, knew very little about patient safety. Uh, and most providers of care would look at quality and safety as perhaps a seminar or a project that they would have to work on once or twice a year. And now I think it's become much more a part of the mainstream. So I think we have uh, a lot of uh, excitement and, and a lot to build on in that respect. Of course, um, you know, the, the work on patient safety in the United States predates me uh, significantly. It predates me by about uh, 100 years. Um, the, the first major initiative in the United States that focused on improving patient safety was the establishment of the, the Food and Drug Administration uh, under the Roosevelt administration. This was in response to the fact that people realized that the, the, the food that they were eating and the drugs that they were taking by and large were developed under very um, uh, unmonitored circumstances and the outcomes were highly variable. Uh, there was a lot of uh, waste, uh, animal waste, human waste in food product, for instance, uh, and there was uh, a lot of um, uh, highly variable process when it came to compounding medications, and as a result, people were suffering very significantly and getting very sick. So the Food and Drug Administration was sort of the beginning of the movement in the United States to think about quality and safety uh, in healthcare. It overlapped a little bit with healthcare through the work on medications. The um, the, the, the movement really, though, became formal and became serious in 1910 with something called the Flexner Report. Abraham Flexner was a researcher who studied all of the medical schools in the United States and determined that the quality of medical education being provided was enormously variable, that in some medical schools, uh, people were actually doing hands-on training and, and uh, learning the skills that they need to learn to become uh, reliable providers of care. In others, they were just reading books, uh, or perhaps uh, in some cases even they were not completing the courses but being given the title of doctor. There was a highly variable system for actually certifying. And so that really became the focus as a result of that report, which infuriated many. That became the focus of the next several years uh, of work when it came to quality and safety in the U.S. There was a, a raft of, of regulation. Uh, so the National Board of Medical Examiners was formed, uh, a group that still exists. It basically does the, the examining for different prof professions. The American College of Sur Surgeons began to certify, uh, and, and we sort of had the, the beginning of any quality movement, which is typically uh, inspection and certification. In 1946, something called the Hill-Burton Act was put into place in sort of the post-war boom, economic boom in the United States. They decided to make a major investment in hospitals to make sure that hospitals were constructed evenly and equally all around the country, that there were actually basic standards of hospital production. And so again, we sort of see this raising the floor approach, an approach that focuses on making sure some basic infrastructure is in place all around the country. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was started in the same year. It was actually started in response to the malaria epidemic and, and started to eradicate malaria in the southern part of the United States. Um, a, a very uh, interesting organization, an organization whose, whose influence and power has obviously expanded very significantly, but nonetheless, um, you can see the beginnings of thinking about standardization in public health and actually trying to propagate public health standards across the United States. And then the Joint Commission on Accreditation uh, was formed in the 1950s, and this is the organization that still exists to this day, which goes and inspects hospitals and makes sure that they uh, assure certain levels of, of basic quality in every organization. Uh, in the mid-60s in the United States, we started our, our program called Medicare um, and uh, Medicaid. I, I, I assume that many of you know Medicare and Medicaid, although I'm sometimes surprised even in the U.S. about uh, how little people know about it and about its origins. So let me just speak about it for one second because it will become relevant. Um, Medicare and Medicaid were the, started as a dream in the 1930s in the Depression in the United States. People said those who don't have health care coverage, the, the elderly and the poor, should have some way to get coverage. The government should be able to provide this in some way. After all, we provided public education in that port, at, at that point. We should provide some form of uh, public health care. 
what happened was that uh, that didn't succeed in the Congress in the 1930s. Uh, President Truman, after the Second World War, also tried to introduce this. It, it still didn't succeed. It wasn't until President Kennedy was assassinated, actually, that the opportunity to pass this legislation through existed. What happened is that President Johnson, after President Kennedy was killed, realized that there was an opportunity to pass this sweeping legislation, to use the sort of the positive political feeling at the time to actually drive forward and drive some change. They had hoped to cover all Americans, but in fact, that proved impossible. What they said is we'll at least cover anyone over the age of 65 and those who are poor uh, and unable to pay for health care services themselves. So Medicare is anyone over the age of 65, and Medicaid is those who are poor and unable to care for themselves. Covers about one third of all Americans. So even though America is known as being the place where health care is primarily privatized, in fact, what you'll find is that uh, over 100 million Americans have their health care covered by the national government, which I think is an important detail. When that happened, what happened in turn is that the federal government began to say to hospitals and to other healthcare organizations, if we're gonna be paying for healthcare, there must be some higher standards of performance. So Medicare introduced optimal achievable standards. They started uh, organizations in every state in the country called professional standards review organizations, now called quality improvement organizations that exist in every state to study performance, to take in complaints from the public, uh, to try to make improvements over time. And then uh, in the 1980s, they made a, a, a even a further investment with the institution of something called the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC. Uh, a, a very small organization, in my opinion, a, an underfunded organization, but an organization that's responsible for doing health services research, for studying the quality and safety of care, uh, and at least making people aware of variation in outcomes uh, so that action can be taken. And in the early 1990s, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the organization that I was a part of, was formed. So I share this with you as just kind of prelude, and I'll go through the rest of the slides very quickly. But what, what this is meant to, to let you know is that we had a history in the United States until the 1990s of chiefly two things, of trying to reduce variation in education and provide some standardization in education, and then also to uh, introduce inspection to introduce accreditation and, and other forms of inspection. And, and what this led to, I think, was uh, a general improvement in the quality of care. Uh, the, 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 the thing that you wouldn't find any longer was enormous variation in facilities or enormous variation in the training of healthcare providers. Uh, but nevertheless, what we found in the 1990s was that for all of this effort, for all of this quality assurance and all of this inspection, uh, what we got in the system was highly variable care and still enormously high levels of harm in the healthcare system. And people have mentioned to Air is Human, our landmark 1999 report, Crossing the Quality Chasm, the sequel to that report. And what they established was that defects in American healthcare and harm in American healthcare are enormous. Uh, the headline in the Washington Post read 44,000 to 98,000 Americans die every year due to medical error. That was the statistic that most people remembered. But in the next three or four years, what you found was uh, a, a proliferation of other similar statistics. 45% um, uh, defect rate in care for adults in a, in a monumental, uh, or, or a, um, a, a significant study by Beth McGlynn. 22% uh, of chronically ill adults reporting serious errors in their care and 74% of them saying that they were dissatisfied with the care that they were receiving. Massive variation in case mix adjusted mortality in U.S. hospitals. This means even if we adjust for the fact that a city hospital might see more acute cases than a rural hospital, and even if we adjust for the fact that uh, one hospital might have more admissions of a certain kind than another hospital, there's still enormous variation in the rate at which people die in different hospitals, a 400% difference. So uh, a significant indicator of variation in quality. And then an estimated 15 million incidents of harm per year in US hospitals. Uh, this was an estimate that we created at the, at the Institute of, uh, for Healthcare Improvement based upon our assessment of uh, medical records retrospective chart review that we did in hospitals around the country. So the picture was, was pretty grim. What was worse is that we realized that in the United States, uh, though we have some great medical technology and great medical professionals, we have all of these problems with quality and 
we're paying much more for health care per capita than other nations who have comparable per capita income. So uh, this was a troubling report that came out in 2004, which showed us that we're really uh, on, a, on a wrong trajectory when it comes to health care spending. The, the only silver linings, I think, from those times in the early 2000s when we were reckoning with the severity of the problem was that leaders began to pay a little bit more attention to the problem. And the headlines made them a little bit uncomfortable. This is a survey that's done every year by the American College of Healthcare Executives. And you can see that over time, leaders began to say that quality and safety were slightly higher priorities year in and year out. Uh, the other uh, crucial outcome of this work was that we began to define quality for ourselves as a system very, very queer, uh, clearly. The, the so-called steep measures of the Institute of Medicine came into play, which said that a high-quality healthcare system is defined by safety, timeliness, equity, effectiveness, uh, efficiency, and patient-centeredness. So we were able to say that, that if we have a fully functioning healthcare system, an idealized healthcare system, these are the dimensions that we'll actually see in the system. And we began to navigate uh, toward, these, uh, toward these goals. We started to focus heavily on safety because, uh, f well, for several reasons. One is we had done some work in the area before. We had some local examples of success that we could build on. We uh, ha had these very striking statistics about the number of Americans that were harmed each year in the course of their care. And we had a, a bit of a public outcry. Uh, the opportunity was there to do something significant on safety. And so what we did is we started with small scale demonstration. Uh, in the period from 2001 to 2011, we worked in a few states, a few large hospital systems to establish results. And then in 2004, we launched uh, this national campaign, the 100,000 Lives campaign, which uh, came out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. It ultimately enrolled 4,000 hospitals around the country and asked them to do six things to reduce medication error, to reduce surgical complication, and to um, uh, reduce infection. And uh, we, we also simultaneously uh, benefited from the fact that Medicare and Medicaid uh, and other accrediting organizations began to inspect with a, a, a bit more intensity. The Joint Commission, for instance, stopped giving people two years notice before they inspected them and started giving them same day notice when they would be inspected so that people couldn't sort of cheat on the test in advance. They'd have to be prepared at all times to provide high quality care. Medicare and Medicaid began to say that we are going to uh, rank hospitals and nursing homes in terms of quality and make that public information. And there's a website called Hospital Compare that provides that comparison. We said we're going to stop paying for uh, certain conditions that we view as avoidable. So things like uh, pressure ulcers and certain forms of infection, the, the payers will no longer pay for those events when they happen. They, they'll no longer reimburse for those events. There was a, a, a series of state regulations that got introduced where departments of health in, in states said that uh, they were going to start to make public information about organizations that were struggling on infection reduction. And then graduate med medical education began to introduce much more rigorous standards when it came to quality and safety. So in, the, in the, the decade from 2001 until 2011, what you see is just a whole raft of different strategies and different approaches applied to try to solve this problem of quality and safety. The subtext of all of this work was people were trying to figure out what's the silver bullet? What's the single solution? What's the approach that will work best? What's the thing that we can do that will really change outcomes and safety? And of course, the answer is there is no silver bullet in this work. The answer is that all of these different approaches are complementary and need to be introduced in order to see the change that we actually want to see. Um, and uh, oh, that's just a map of the hospitals that took part in the 100,000 Lives campaign. Um, but but re you know, this is an important point, I think, to make that as, as you think about your safety journey, there is going to be no single strategy that will be the key strategy. And I think the good news is you've heard here a variety of different strategies today that could be applied uh, with, with some effect. I will tell you that from my own experience in the United States, fear-based strategies, which are strategies that shame people, expose people, punish people, 
tend to work quite less effectively than uh, positive reinforcement, recognition, appeals to people's professionalism, giving people access to data and information. Uh, those types of, of incentives seem to be more meaningful. And on the question of payment specifically and, and payment incentives, you know, we have two very important studies, which if you haven't read them, I'd suggest that you do. Uh, by Webster that were published on hospital pay for performance initiatives and nursing home pay for performance initiatives. And uh, they found that there was really no significant impact on outcomes associated with pay for performance alone. So we, we, uh, uh, it just re-emphasizes the point that we have to take a lot of approaches, I think, to trying to improve safety. We did in this 10 year period get some results. There was a 58% national reduction in central line infections between 2001 and 2009. Uh, the major inflection point happened in 2004 uh, and, and 2005. Um, and then uh, the sort of the major uh, popular result came in 2008 with the work that you've heard described in the state of Michigan uh, from Peter Pronovost. In New Jersey, uh, 150 hospitals reduced pressure ulcers by 70%. Uh, many organizations reported going over a year without a ventilator associated pneumonia. Ascension Health, which is uh, one of the leading private systems in the country, a nonprofit system of about 70 hospitals, saw all of these reductions below the national average in birth trauma, neonatal mortality, pressure ulcers, bloodstream infections, falls, you name it. So there's really a, a significant movement that happened in the country. But as we sat in 2011, uh, when I moved to Medicare and Medicaid and joined Don Berwick there, when, when he became the administrator of Medicare and Medicaid, we still were reckoning with, with these data, which showed us at that time that in most major, major measures of quality, the United States uh, was still in the bottom of the class when it came to nations uh, that have similar per capita income. And so you can see in safety ranking the lowest in the world still after all of this considerable effort um, uh, during that 10 year period. I shouldn't say the lowest in the world, but the lowest in this, this group of nations in that 10 year period. Uh, and in addition, we found again that there is enormous variation in spending in different parts of the country. Here you can see the differences in spending, per capita spending in different parts of the country. Where it's darker blue, it means there's more spending. Where it's lighter green, it means there's less spending. But what we found is there is absolutely no correlation, zero correlation, between the amount that got spent and the levels of quality and safety that we actually observed in the country. So that means that in some parts of the country they're spending two or three thousand dollars less per capita than other parts of the country and getting better results than those parts of the country that were spending so much more. So really, we, you know, we had a, a serious problem on our hands as we uh, kind of went into this work in 2011. The opportunity that we had was created by uh, the Affordable Care Act, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act which is the biggest healthcare legislation we've had in the United States since 1965, since Medicare and Medicaid were introduced. It's known now in the US as Obamacare, associated with President Obama. Um, and Obamacare said that two significant things were going to happen as a result of this legislation. First, more Americans were going to get health care coverage. One of our great national shames is that there are over 40 million Americans who have no health care coverage. So when they get sick, they avoid health care, uh, and often uh, they uh, are introduced to enormous financial burdens when they have to finally seek health care, uh, burdens that, that can bankrupt them and, and uh, lead to generations of difficulty and suffering. So we said the first thing we're going to do is we're going to increase coverage, and that's been a, a major focus of Obamacare. And in the end of October, we begin to offer coverage to uh, roughly 30 million more Americans. The, uh, the second element of the legislation, though, the element that most people in the world aren't familiar with, was a focus on saying, if we're going to add this many more people onto coverage, then we have to figure out, we have to understand how to actually make health care less expensive. We have to figure out how to reduce cost per capita. And we're not going to do that by cutting services because that would be inhumane, that would, that would run counter to what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, but we're also not gonna, gonna do that by uh, a adding anything. It's not possible to add anything in the current economic environment. So the only way to improve uh, or to reduce costs is by improving quality. 
And that's the second major element of this law that, that most people aren't aware of. It forced us to do two things specifically. One was to develop a national quality strategy. And the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality actually was responsible, along with Medicare and Medicaid, for developing this document, which outlined what we were going to focus on as a nation, the areas in which we would make improvement. They were making care more affordable. They were improving health upstream, so making sure that we had fewer people with heart disease and obesity and diabetes and all of the chronic diseases that burden the healthcare system. And then they were to make the quality of care itself better. Our estimates as we went into this work is that um, about a third of all healthcare spending in the United States is waste, which is to say that uh, for, for every dollar we spent, 33 cents on that dollar is administrative cost, it's paying for harm events or patient safety events, it's paying for fraudulent activity from doctors and hospitals, it's paying for uh, other forms of variation in quality, overuse for instance of uh, radiology or other services that we know are not needed in certain circumstances. And, and this is all rooted in the fact that we have a fee-for-service system, that we're constantly paying for new procedures. So we said we're going to have to really try to shift the mark and reduce that waste. And the way that we uh, were enabled in the law to focus on reducing the waste was through a center called the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, uh, a $10 billion center uh, that, that I was part of the team that, that began the center. And, and it said to us, you have to significantly reduce the cost of health care by making improvements to the quality of care. And lo and behold, our first initiative here to reduce waste focused on patient safety. So this was the place where we felt we could get the most significant foothold initially in actually improving safety. And we introduced something called the Partnership for Patients in the beginning of 2011. Um, in the midst of all of the talk about Obamacare, it's kind of ironic that this initiative hasn't really received very much coverage. The 100,000 Lives campaign at IHI, which was a $5 million initiative, got 250 million media impressions. It was in all the papers all around the country. This initiative, which is a $1 billion initiative, that's billion with a B, uh, is, is hardly making the news at all. Uh, but the good news is it's making a difference. And, um, and the way it's making a difference is by setting very clear, very crisp aims about what we want to try to accomplish and by uh, making sure that people around the country have the resources to actually expend on this work. So just about every state has significant money to work on quality and safety. And the hypothesis is that the investment that we are making, about a billion dollars, should pay off in about $35 billion worth of savings. So that's our calculation. With a $1 billion investment, $35 billion of savings, our goal is a 40% reduction in preventable hospital harm and a 20% reduction in 30-day admissions in a three-year period. And I can tell you now, just based on data, I've seen interim data that good progress is being made there. So we continue to try to push the envelope and drive forward in this important work. These are the areas that are being focused on in this work. Uh, some of them infection reduction, uh, pressure ulcers, venous thromboembolism, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, surgical complication. Many of the things we've worked on for many years were intensifying our efforts as a result of that initiative and a result of this work. Let me just close by, by offering an observation. Having worked in the United States on patient safety and having worked in a number of other countries on patient safety, I feel like, though I'm not a clinical expert, I, I'm sort of an anthropologist, and I've been able to study the differences in uh, organizations, states, countries that seem to be having better and worse results when it comes to patient safety. And I'll just offer you that the, the places that really seem to be thriving um, are, are uh, a very unique group of organizations that take what I call the path, the path less taken. It's a, it's a rare path. The path more taken is when organizations kind of have a general mission statement. They generally want to improve safety. They spend a lot of time on coming to consensus about guidelines and the things that they're trying to produce. They uh, focus heavily on measurement and regulation and inspection. And uh, they have a high reliance on websites and publishing as their theory for how information will be disseminated and how behavior will change. As Jason said, all of those things are necessary. All of those things are valuable. But what really makes a difference 
is clear public aims, very crisp, quantifiable goals. It's frightening to have them in place because it introduces the possibility of failure, but without it, we lose an enormous amount of energy. Relentless leadership attention to the pace at which change is happening. Leaders who are surveying this work every week, I can tell you that at Medicare and Medicaid, the Secretary of Health and Human Services was reviewing the progress of the Partnership for Patients every two weeks. She expected a report on results on every single one of the interventions, and you better believe that that created a lot of energy and a lot of attention throughout the government and throughout the organizations that we funded. She was actively removing barriers to progress all the time, not just expecting passive reports, but being out there in the field helping us remove barriers to progress, uh, and, and taking an approach which I would liken to sort of an, an emergency management approach. You wouldn't recognize it as business as usual in some of these hospitals. What you have is incident command. You have people who come into the organization, and every day they're seeking out harm, they're seeking out error, and they're trying to root it out systematically in the work that they do. So it's crucial that that energy is brought to the work. There's heavy bias toward rapid testing and, uh, and measurement. This was uh, an example, actually, that I found recently in Honduras, of all places, of run charts and control charts in a remote rural clinic. It just shows you that this kind of information and this kind of data, when made available, can actually really galvanize people and give them energy and drive them towards change. Um, and I'll skip this slide, although it takes a long time to, to do so. <laughs> Um, but uh, this is an example actually of a hospital system that names all of the people that they harm. So at their board meeting every month, they're actually sitting down and naming the people who are harmed in the course of the care that they provide. Uh, so it's not just a statistic, but they put a human face to it. What, what I think the, the, you know, the point I, I'm trying to make in closing is that the, the way this work feels in organizations and countries and states that are making really significant change is it is it feels like a crisis and and that's because it is a crisis I told you at the start of this that 15 million Americans every year get harmed in the course of the year uh, of, of their care which means that today as we've sat here thousands have been harmed some of them permanently in the course of their care and yet by and large, we treat this pretty passively. We have conversations about it, we meet about it, we provide guidelines about it. We haven't, and I'm here only speaking about the United States, I don't know if this is the case in Brazil, we haven't treated this as the emergency that it actually is. Only in those places that treat it as an emergency, use data each and every day to assess their progress and make adjustments, do you actually see the type of change that you observe in a place like Scotland. That's really, I think, crucial to, to what we see. So trying to create this new model of management is instrumental to actually changing patient safety in a significant way. That's, I think, the next frontier for all of our work. So thank you, and uh, again, uh, finish where I started, say congratulations on the terrific work you're doing, and look forward to being a part of the conversation going forward. Muito obrigado, Joe. Eu creio que essa mesa da tarde foi extremamente ilustrativa dos esforços e, sobretudo, é, 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 da, do comprometimento sustentado, permanente, relentless, para, e da liderança necessária para alcançar. Eu acho que o Ministério da Saúde do Brasil deu um importante passo criando esse Programa Nacional de Segurança do Paciente, mas lembrar que agora, com o John acabou de falar, começou com 10 years, uma jornada de 10 anos. Quer dizer, é, a Cláudia, quando fez a linha do tempo, esse esforço vem saltitando de uma maneira mais organizada é, ao nível da, das preocupações do Ministério da Saúde em 96, né, Cláudia? 96. É, é, e espero que agora nós tenhamos, com esse seminário e com essa iniciativa desse programa, dado um passo muito importante. Nós vamos fazer um intervalo agora, correto? Intervalo agora para um break e depois voltamos para a pergunta, tá bom? Muito obrigado, muito obrigado aos parceiros, obrigado a Odete, obrigado Jason, obrigado Joe. Vamos retomar aqui. Uh, o doutor Noronha me pediu para concluir a mesa, já que ele tinha que pegar um voo. Uh, para quem não me conhece, eu é, sou a Patrícia Ferraz. Trabalho na Agência Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária e faço parte também do Comitê Nacional de Implementação do, do Programa de Segurança do Paciente. É, agora, nessa etapa, a gente vai abrir, então, para alguns questionamentos, algumas perguntas. Né? Se forem muitas, a gente faz aí alguns blocos. 
Uh, tem um microfone que está que tá disponível, além dos microfones de quem está na, na, nesses assentos aqui da frente. E, portanto, então, está aberto aí aos questionamentos. Alguém inscrito, sem brigas, por favor. Tenho a impressão que as palestras foram muito bem entendidas. As pessoas não têm dúvidas, senão... Doutor Mário, então. Bom, uh, meu nome é Mário Borges, eu sou da Fundação Hospitalar do Estado de Minas Gerais, sou do Comitê é, de Segurança do Paciente e presidente do ISMP Brasil. Tá? Minha pergunta é para a colega do México. Eu gostaria de saber o que, que uh, em termos de uso seguro de medicamentos, que foi uh, feito no programa de vocês lá. Eu ouvi, ouvi você falar sobre é, várias questões, mas eu não ouvi especificamente sobre medicamentos. Obrigado. Você deveria ter estendido aos outros. Mais alguém? Então, acho que eu vou... Bueno, efectivamente, eh, nosotros nos basamos en ese momento en el estudio IBEAS que hicimos. Esperábamos ver, conforme a la literatura, un 30% de problemas eh, relacionados con la medicación. Sin embargo, los resultados no fueron hacia, hacia ese problema, sino hacia infecciones nosocomiales y procedimientos. Por eso fue que las iniciativas principales están enfocadas hacia esa, esas dos áreas. Justa, justo esta mañana estaba platicando con Itziar de la importancia de los medicamentos y de formar parte de la iniciativa que OMS tiene en torno a ellos. Eh, en este momento, iniciativas en, en México específicamente para eso, únicamente las tiene contempladas lo que es la certificación de hospitales, que es voluntaria, y hay un apartado que es el MMU, en donde vienen todos los lineamientos que tiene que tener un hospital de buenas prácticas en torno a lo que es medicamentos. Tienen que cumplir con todo esto, que no estén caducos, eh, que se tengan los cinco correctos, etcétera, para poderlos tener. Y también, bueno, dentro de las diez acciones que el cartel que estaba ahí, que está ligado a lo que son las metas internacionales, uno de ellos sí está enfocado a lo que es el medicamento, los cinco correctos el medicamento correcto, el paciente correcto, la vía correcta, la rapidez, etc. Uh -huh. Son realmente las iniciativas que hay hasta este momento en, en México en cuanto a medicamentos. Obrigada, doctora Dete. ¿Más algún cuestionamiento? ¿Más alguna cosa? A Claudia. Yo quería preguntar a Jason. Uh, pelo que eu entendi, o escopo do, da compreensão do, do que é a segurança e da, da intervenção nessa área está tá abrangendo, quer dizer, sendo maior, mais abrangente, tanto do ponto de vista do, do sistema de saúde como até fora do sistema de saúde. É, a minha pergunta, é, primeiro, é se isso pode levar a uma perda de foco. Né? E a segunda pergunta é se, é, ao longo do tempo, como o programa da Escócia é um programa muito bem sucedido, qual é, quais, se vocês têm pensado quais são as intervenções necessárias para que é, o programa não venha, pouco a pouco, perder a efetividade. So I understood this. Mais uma questão, é isso? O Brasil apresenta, na, na última década, praticamente, uma mudança de cultura na área da saúde com a implantação do Programa de Saúde da Família. A gente percebe alguma diferença na, na cultura. É, mas, de certa forma ele continua sendo, a, a saúde continua sendo assistencialista. Eu queria saber de vocês, dos expositores, é, qual dificuldade vocês tiveram e se enfrentaram o problema 
de driblar, vamos dizer assim, uma situação de uma cultura voltada para o profissional médico, em detrimento de todos os outros profissionais da equipe de saúde, e a questão da, da assistência, é, a, do, do cuidado ser baseado na assistência, na cura, perdão, no, na, na assistência curativa. E é, como cada um conseguiu, ou se enfrentou ou não, como conseguiu resolver essa situação, já que a gente sabe que é, a gente precisa envolver a equipe toda para se conseguir alguma coisa de resultado positivo. Mas, ah, temos mais uma questão. Ali. E aí a gente fecha esse bloco, então. Eu queria fazer a pergunta para o Joe, é, porque ele falou que lá no que o Medicare não paga pelos eventos, por exemplo, a pessoa fez uma cirurgia, teve uma infecção. O Medicare não paga por esses eventos. Eu queria saber se, se é assim também com as operadoras de planos de saúde. Eu estou perguntando isso porque eu trabalho na ANS, que é a agência reguladora de planos de saúde aqui no Brasil. Queria saber se funciona assim para todo o sistema ou só o Medicare. Ok, então vamos passar para a mesa. É, podemos começar então com o Dr. Jay. So, so I'm going to be cheeky and go back to Mario's question about drugs, even though you didn't ask me the question. So we have five. The, I didn't have time, but the the safety program has five work streams, areas of work: critical care or intensive care wards, general medical and surgical wards, uh, leadership, operating theatres, and medicines. So inside the medicines work stream, there are a series of interventions that may be helpful for you around where we chose to start. They're, they're not the right ones, they're not the wrong ones, they're just where we chose to start. The, the, the biggest challenge in the whole programme of all the things we've done has been medicines reconciliation has been getting the medicines correct on admission, on each transition through care, and on discharge. It's been the hardest single intervention of all 40. But we have learned a great deal about how to do it, who to use for it, so there may be something in there for you. Claudia's question. So I understood the second part of your question. I'm not sure I understood the first. Is your first question expanding outside healthcare? Does that mean we've lost focus on healthcare? Is that your first question? This is a one question. So when you you you, you dealing more, or, well, let's say it's not. I'm not getting into the merits of uh, of uh, looking at how families deal with children at home. Uh, but I think it's something different from what we what was what is let's say the core of patient safety up to now. So. Uh, Okay, I understand. Okay. So, so the early year, the work I described around early years is nothing to do with patient safety. It's the development of the method that we have used in patient safety into new areas of work. Because we believe that the quality improvement method, the setting an aim, setting a time limit to the aim, having evidence and changes set, the measurement, the fast measurement, the fast changes, we believe that the method is applicable to whatever you want to improve. Whether you want to improve getting yourself out of bed in the morning, getting to work on time, or the first five years of life across Scotland's one million children. So, so it's not patient safety. The second question around, do you have to f keep it fresh all the time? Do you? Yes, you do. We've, we are now five years, five and a half years since we began the safety programme. We, we've just, we're about to announce, and the Scottish people don't know this yet, so at the end of August, we're having our next learning event, the big safety learning event, and at that event, we're going to announce 10 interventions that we believe are done, implemented. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to stop monitoring them, it just means we're going to monitor them in a different way. We're going to stop testing, we're going to have all of the mainstream organisations sign up to those 10 interventions, say that the safety programme has done them, they are implemented, 
they're done. We're then going to replace those 10 with some new things. And we, we know, for instance, that we've eradicated a lot of the infections that come from peripheral lines, cannulas. We know that those infections are almost gone across the whole country. But we have a whole lot of infections from urinary catheters that we haven't eradicated because we haven't even tried. So now we're going to focus on urinary catheters. We're going to focus on pressure ulcers and we're going to focus on falls, which we haven't done. So we're gradually trying to tick off each of the different, each of the different sections. So you have to keep, you, the, the journey will never be done. Saf safety, is, safety is a constant fight and it, it will never be finished. But we have, we've replaced some of the things that we think, like the surgical checklist. The surgical checklist is embedded, everybody uses it. That doesn't mean that we can be complacent, but at least we can stop testing it. Now we're going to replace it with other things that we're going to test. Does that answer your question? But we, we do it around the brand that has been successful. So we do it around the safety program, which everybody now understands. The, Sylvia's question about uh, the healthcare professionals. So you, you won't know that Sylvia and I had a conversation at coffee and Sylvia lived in Scotland for five years. So she's the smartest person in the room. She's because she chose to live in the finest country in the world. So we, we, have, we have found a, a gradual increase in doctor engagement over time. When we first started, the first room we spoke in had no doctors. And when we launched the mental health version of the safety program, which was five years after the beginning, the room was 60% doctors. I, I think there's a lot of nonsense spoken about medical engagement. I think medics get engaged when it is engaging. I don't know if that translates into Portuguese very well, but I, th I think it, they get engaged when it is engaging. They just have seen so many initiatives and so much time wasted on things that they don't think are important over decades. So I'm not surprised they don't turn up at the beginning. But once they start to see data, they start to see change, they start to believe it, then they can't get enough of it. Now, now we have too many doctors interested. We, 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 our, our capacity building events, our fellowships, the things we do for clinicians to come and be educated, they are oversubscribed. And at the beginning, I couldn't get them to come at all. You just start, just start. Um, I was wearing my headphones because I needed the translation. <laughs> For Scottish. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to do what Jason did, actually, which is uh, I'd like to answer Mario's question if I could. I'm sorry, just very quickly, only because I think it might be helpful. Uh, we have had the same challenges with medication safety. The commonest, commonest form of harm in the U.S. is medication error. Uh, we introduced medication reconciliation in the 100,000 Lives campaign. It was a failure. Um, though gradually people have become better at it over time and it's to do in part with an electronic medical record uh, that doesn't have to, f so the medical record doesn't have to travel from admission to uh, one unit to discharge. It's, it's all, you know, the same record electronically. So that has helped. But the other thing is we focused on uh, look-alike and sound-alike drugs. As, a, as an area of focus, and that got great traction in 2007 and 2008. And so as just, I would just offer that as an area where there is a very uh, discrete how-to guide that exists on how to reduce error associated with look-alike and sound-alike drugs, and that might be useful. Um, to the, uh, I also wanted to talk about the, the, the question of sustainability a bit. Um, and uh, I just wanted to share that, um, a colleague and I at uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement did a study of 25 health systems that had successfully sustained their progress. And we, we identified three things that were key to successfully sustaining the progress. One was continued leadership attention. So a, on at least a monthly basis, leaders were actually reviewing the data on progress over time. The second was data. And it wasn't just measurement but it was actually the availability of data to people at the front line. So there, you know, people become very interested in these data once they become available. So, so the fact that I as a uh, you know, intensivist can be given a set of 
uh, data about the central line infection rate in my unit, it's very motivating and I know that others see it and I know that others see my success with my patient. And the third thing was creating forcing functions. So actually creating physical forcing functions. For instance, packaging together all of the elements of a central line uh, uh, insertion package uh, in the same physical drawer, the same physical location. That was the, that was the third uh, predictor. So those, those, that was just a checklist that became useful to me in my work. Uh, to the question about um, the uh, uh, do private payers have pursue no pay conditions? Uh, do, they, do they withhold payment for certain conditions? The answer is yes. Um, uh, there are lots of exceptions and qualifications that were sort of introduced in the process of negotiation and so that, that at times is um, softened the, um, the, the harshness, if you will, of, of those penalties, but nonetheless, um, th there are certain infections, for instance, that, that no longer get paid for by private payers as well. The other interesting thing I'd share with you is that many of the professions, many of the healthcare professionals have begun to self-regulate. A very interesting program is something called Choosing Wisely, which began last year in the States, which I think is tremendous. It's basically a set of procedures that the American Board of Internal Medicine uh, has identified as being um, wasteful or excessive or unnecessary in most instances. And so they're advising their providers not to provide those procedures, not to introduce those treatments uh, because of the cost that it introduces, the unnecessary cost that it introduces, uh, and the potential for harm associated with unnecessary treatment. So I, I think that that, that symbolizes this kind of change that's happening, this revolution that's happening based on the fact that we are beginning to pay people, again, less for volume, less for seeing a lot of patients, and more for quality, keeping a population healthy, and actually using preventative services, using public health officials to keep them out of the, uh, the health system so that they're healthier upstream and don't, don't create a burden on the system uh, later on. So the, the, the change in incentives, I think, has been meaningful in getting professions and payers to think differently uh, about how they work. Eh, bueno, en relación a la pregunta de Silvia, de cultura, eh, bueno, por un lado eh, considero que debe demostrarse el compromiso desde el más alto nivel para que tanto médicos como enfermeras como todos se alineen. Si no hay compromiso en el más alto nivel, nadie va a voltear a ver la iniciativa. En el caso de México, desde el presidente Fox estaba en su Plan Nacional de Desarrollo la parte de calidad y seguridad del paciente. En el en caso del presidente Calderón también se repitió en su Plan Nacional de Desarrollo y ahora en el caso del presidente Peña Nieto eh, está más inclinado hacia lo que es eh, la atención universal, pero también con calidad. Entonces, en ese sentido tienes ya una línea y va a haber un presupuesto designado para este tipo de programas, ese es un buen punto. Ya aterrizando lo más a nivel local en una unidad hospitalaria, se debe demostrar también este compromiso de su director. Si el director general del hospital o instituto o lo que sea, no tiene el compromiso, tampoco le van a hacer caso. ¿Por qué? Porque les va a dar miedo, por ejemplo, reportar eventos adversos, medirlos, les va a dar miedo hablar cuando algo salga mal. En cambio, si el, el director está comprometido, y por eso era la sensibilización de los talleres que hicimos nosotros, tenía que ir el director, si no, no se daba. Si él está comprometido, va a saber su personal que tiene el respaldo para llevar a cabo la iniciativa. De otra manera, van a tener miedo. ¿no? Y eh, finalmente, también ellos tienen que saber el beneficio de hacer las cosas con calidad para tener seguridad en, en, en la atención. Si ellos ven el beneficio de no voy a tener demandas, voy a tener menos trabajo, eh, puedo publicar cosas de que estoy haciendo las cosas bien, voy a tener evidencia de que lo que digo que hago bien, efectivamente lo estoy haciendo bien, etc. En la medida en que ellos vean estos beneficios, van a trabajar por ello. Entonces, pues bueno, esos son los consejos. Bom, uh, si no tiver más ningún cuestionamiento, acredito que no, ¿no? Yo gosto. Ah, disculpa, Vitor. Eh, Mi pregunta es bien simple. Eh, considerando el papel de la liderança para a melhoria da qualidade, para ações em prol da segurança, 
queria saber dos nossos três palestrantes, do ponto de vista da profissionalização da gestão, particularmente da gestão hospitalar, quais foram assim, os grandes eixos ou grandes medidas que aconteceram, enfim, nos países de vocês, ou, enfim, ainda que seja ligado à própria discussão da segurança do paciente. Eu vou pedir, então, para os palestrantes, ao responder, já também fazer suas considerações finais para a gente encerrar a mesa. Tá bom? Podemos começar com o Jason? So, uh, I'm not sure professionalization of management tran tran so then I hear Portuguese, that doesn't help. So my own my my own Scottish translated into Portuguese. It's terrifying. So I, I'm not sure I understand professionalization of management. Do, do you mean so so in, in my world that would mean how we made managers more professional, how we made it a profession, or do you mean what the leaders did inside the safety work? Okay, so, so the more generic. So in the, in, you'll know who Tony Blair was, many of you. The man who took the UK into the Iraq war. That's not why we're going to talk about him, but t t Tony Blair uh, and his health minister of the time, a man called Alan Milburn, in the early 1990s, decided that the UK health service, the whole UK health service was poorly managed. And it had principally been managed by doctors. It hadn't been managed at all, in fact. What it had been is that the power had been vested in the medical profession. And Blair and Milburn did the most radical reform of the health service uh, until the English decided to reform it again in the last 12 months. But up until then, probably the most radical form there had been. And what they did was they introduced general management as a core set of individuals and a core profession inside the national healthcare system. And they did it using the industry model, using the industry model of a chief executive, a finance director, a, an HR director, all of the normal things you would have if you ran Vodafone or if you ran a bank. And they, they introduced that on the top of existing medical management. You can imagine how that went down with the, with the existing medical management. So we ended up almost with parallel structures of medical management, nursing management, and general management. And we had that in Scotland as well until Scotland became devolved and we were able to, to change things. Now, all four UK countries, Jonathan may have, may have a view that differs or more knowledge, all, all four UK countries have now reached some form of equilibrium, some form of new way, where there is usually at some level in the healthcare systems a, a triad of people, a, a senior manager, a doctor, sometimes a dentist, usually a doctor, and a nurse. And that triad of individuals are at the top table, and then again all the way down through the system, down to a ward level or a practice level, where those three people work together. And increasingly, the managers are becoming professional. They, are, they have specific qualifications. There is a career structure. So the system in Scotland that I know best, those, those managers can now go on. You can train to be a healthcare manager. And we take the elite group and we give them special training and we... And safety and quality are now intrinsic to their education. So it's taken us a while to get, it's probably taken us 20 years to get from that first initial general management training now to a more elaborate. And remember, our managers don't just run hospitals. I don't have hospital leaders. I have health system leaders. So they're not in charge of hospitals. They're in charge of the whole healthcare system in, for that community, which happens to include hospitals but it also includes public health, primary care, everything else. So the chief executive is the chief executive of the system, not just of the hospital. Um, it, you know, in the, in the American context, in the United States context, uh, in terms of building the, the patient safety movement and engaging leaders in the patient safety movement, the um, the, the groups that we had to influence were three. The boards of directors of the hospitals, most of whom don't have very much clinical background. The hospital CEOs and CFOs, uh, and I think the chief financial officer 
is important to, to think about. And then the, um, the, the clinical leaders, the chief nursing officer, the chief medical officer. And I think the, the way to engage all of them is it's a sort of a similar recipe but with different points of emphasis. The first is to present the problem uh, and to just simply uh, lay bare how stark the problem is. I showed you that slide from that hospital which you know shows that names the people that it harms every month and the types of harm that it actually introduces. Uh, and in some cases now people are also introducing the financial problem that, that may be associated with underperforming on safety. So making that problem clear, making the risk clear, the risk to reputation, the financial risk, the moral risk uh, clear to that group. Um, Presenting the market opportunity that's associated with being good or being at quality and safety. So for a private organization, you can differentiate yourself and actually do much better if you're known to be excellent in quality and safety. That's why some hospitals go to great lengths to become certified by every organization under the sun. I'm not sure that's a productive behavior, but that's something that some do. Um, and then finally, presenting the data. And I think this is especially important for the clinicians. I'll tell you a story that I think is, is very, very illustrative. I visited a hospital in Mississippi in the US. Uh, Mississippi is typically the, the state that performs worst on anything, really. Education, healthcare, you name it. It's, uh, it's really uh, a troubled state. And if you looked at, for instance, um, maternal and neonatal outcomes, they're, they're, uh, they're terrifying. They're really quite bad. Um, but they have a hospital in Tupelo, Mississippi, the, the home of Elvis Presley. They have a, a, a hospital there called North Mississippi Medical Center, which won the Malcolm Baldridge Award for quality, the highest quality award that can be given to an institution. And uh, I asked them, what's the secret to your work? How do, you, how do you get such great quality? How do you do this? I said, do you follow the standards set by CMS or by the Joint Commission? Or do you take the interventions from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement? And the chief medical officer looked at me and he shook his head and he said, no, I don't know, really know what you're talking about. He said, we look at our own data every month and the head doctor and the head nurse and every unit decide what they're going to improve based upon their own data every month. So it's changing the dynamics from some outside organization is bothering people and telling them what to do to saying to these professionals who take their work very seriously, Here's the data on how you improve your performance, or here's the data on your performance. Now you decide how you're going to improve it. And they, they go and, and do great work, unsurprisingly, because they, they want to do great work. So that change in dynamics, I think, is, is crucially important. The last thing I'll say, you just asked us for any uh, closing comment. The, the last thing I'll say is that you know, I, I, whenever I'm at a meeting like this, I, I always think the same thing, which is, we, we know the problem of patient safety well. We've established it. We've done prevalence studies. We know that harm is a serious problem. I think that's well established. We have enormous resources, incredible resources of the kind we heard about this morning here in Brazil, globally, lots of knowledge, lots of expertise. Um, you know, the, the, um, the key is to start on local implementation as soon as possible. And uh, for me, that means introducing a simple intervention that everyone anywhere can do, having a broad strategy that says, here's one thing that everyone in the country will do this quarter, and we're going to solve the problem of hand hygiene, or we're going to solve the problem of look-alike medications, or whatever it is. We're going to just do it. Everyone's going to do it. And then working deeply with a few advanced organizations to, to innovate and to really get to whole new levels of performance, whole new orders of magnitude of harm reduction simultaneously. So I always say broad, you know, everybody and deep with a few organizations, and I think that's the way forward toward uh, implementation. En cuanto a, a lo de eh, qué se ha hecho en México en torno a, a la gerencia, eh, uno de los problemas grandes cuando empezó la Cruzada Nacional por la Calidad fue, bueno, sí, esto es todo lo que tenemos que hacer, pero ¿y quién lo va a hacer? No había una figura, o no existe una figura que sea como un elemento de calidad dentro del hospital que se dedique a, a hacer todas estas iniciativas. Entonces, eh, se desarrolló, así como hay una residencia de ortopedia, de cirugía, de medicina interna, etcétera, ahora en México hay una residencia de calidad. Entonces, es, el perfil es un médico egresado eh, de medicina general, 
y hace tres años de, de calidad dentro de una organización hospitalaria. Y la verdad es que estos chicos tienen como dos o tres años que han estado egresando. Se lo roban en el segundo que, que sale de, de, de la residencia, ya tiene trabajo en algún hospital, porque los hospitales están ávidos de tener gente que sepa cómo implementar las medidas de calidad y las herramientas de calidad. Esa ha sido una de las medidas en México. Eh, ¿Qué otra cosa? Ah, bueno, también eh, en la Secretaría de Salud hay, una, hay un, una herramienta que se llama Acuerdo de Gestión, en donde se invita a todos los hospitales a hacer un programa de mejora de calidad y pasa a concurso, si lo gana se le da el presupuesto para desarrollar esa iniciativa y es una manera de, de gestionar recursos para la mejora de la calidad dentro de los hospitales. También existe el Premio Nacional de Calidad, cada año se reciben todos los trabajos hechos durante ese periodo y es una manera de incentivarlos y hacer que sigan eh, mejorando. Y bueno, ya para cerrar, yo lo único que les diría es, por cada tres pasos que den en materia de calidad y seguridad del paciente, no importa que de pronto los retroceda, lo retrocedan un paso, siempre y cuando ustedes sigan adelante otros tres, otros tres, y cuando volteen ya van a tener trabajo realizado y, y siempre es posible mejorar. Muito obrigada. É, realmente vai ser um, um, uma caminhada árdua, mas todos aqui estão muito motivados né, a iniciá-la. Já começamos e vamos continuar em frente. É, agradeço aqui a mesa, a, a presença de todos, o aceite do convite. É, passo para o Walter dar algumas instruções sobre a reunião técnica de amanhã e me despeço de todos. Obrigada.